Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of uh, the Red Leaf Retrocast uh, Anime Cast. Today, this is episode 21, and we're going to be talking about a special show. At least a special show to me. We're going to be talking about Akage no Ann. And today, I'm joined with the uh, usual people that are always there. I'm joined with Hiki. How you doing? Hi. I'm doing fine. Doing great. That's good. Starting for my big, the biggest test of my life. Sounds exciting. Fun time. <laughs> You're also recording for the car again, so the car is making a reappearance. Yeah, the car is back. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, all is great in this world. And uh, I'm also joined with... Uh, JD. JD, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Got the show all completed. It's a show six weeks in the making, isn't it, for us? Right, guys? That it is. Or at least for you two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today <laughs> without you, Tori, and how much the show meant to you, and you just had to spread the slew of emotions to the rest of us. Yeah. And oh. Put emotions on that. And <laughs> might, might, I, might I also add that you guys are just the best anime bosom buddies one can ask for. Aww. That's disgusting. <laughs> 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 that's only cute when I mean, little girls say yeah. it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean it that way, that way. I don't mean it that way. Shut oh, up. Sure. You, get your dirty... Yeah, sure, get your mind out yeah. the gutter, Hickey. God. Yeah, We're talking go, about... Go it. watch your Soul Walker streams and see who... Which... which character thought is big <laughs> that's because of the guitar okay don't judge me <laughs> oh yeah of course of course it's because of the guitar yeah it's the only sure. character with the guitar i swear but anyways this isn't about soul worker not this time maybe in the future but not this time um yeah now we're gonna be talking about akagano and then obviously at the end i'm gonna ask you if i was right or if i was right and i assume i was right uh but other than that let's just get into this and uh to start off, I have just a small uh, quest update. It's only one show this time. I've been slowing down a little bit. I've had some tests of my own and whatnot, so uh, I haven't really had the chance to watch that much. But I did at least manage to finish uh, uh, Planet S from uh, 2003. And uh, Planet S was a show that I was really interested in uh, in checking out. Uh, I'd heard people talk about it and say it is good. But, like, you know, there's so obviously this little bit of skepticism. Uh, Skepticism in uh, in you when you hear it's like, well, what's the show about? Well, it's about the garbage collectors in space. It's like, I see. Uh, so what can they do with that? And at first, I start watching it and it's kind of just like a cool remembering back to my childhood. It was like, look, you remember like being a child and looking up at space and me like, that is so cool. And then, you know, they go to space and then they actually work in space. But then, you know, other stuff starts kicking in as well. You have political infighting, you have company, like the company rules, stuff that, like that, personal conflicts and whatnot, and it just turns into a much bigger show than I expected from it, and honestly, I think that show is incredibly good. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't checked it out yet, then uh, you should definitely put it in your plan to watch list, at least, because I do think this is one show that is worth checking out. Uh, I could, the only... The only thing I can see people having a bit of a problem with is some of the characters, as especially uh, uh, they can be a bit. I want to I want to call them eccentric because they are, uh, but they can be a bit. Let's put it this way: they are they got their heads very far up their own ass in their own uh, like worldview and whatnot, and they don't tell anyone that what they think is the right way is is wrong. But that's that's kind of the point. But I can't see that being a bit of an annoyance for some for some people. It's like, oh my god, you're so dense. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's fantastic, great show. Uh, I have not ri yet written a review, but it will be up yet. So just stay tuned on our Mal page, the uh, Worldwide Weeps, uh, Redly Retrocast Worldwide Weeps on Mal, and uh, it will be up there at some point, hopefully very soon. I haven't seen Planetus yet, but uh, it's on my second quest. <laughs> for me. Well, look forward to it. It's a good show. Yeah, I haven't either, but when I come back to watching it anyway, I might just slide it in. You should. Slide it right in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, good yes. Time. <laughs> well, seriously, I, I told you guys to get your minds out of the gutter. We're going to be talking about a children's show today, okay? This mm, is not the right place for your mind. Children. <laughs> Delicious. Jesus. 
Jesus, JD. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, we have some questions. Oh, for it's been a uh, while, this podcast. Hasn't it? Yeah, and there's three questions, so we can read one question each. Ooh. Who wants to start? You. Okay, I want to start. Apparently, thanks for th- thanks for letting me know that I want to start, JD. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, let's see. The first question is: Are there any anime that you really enjoyed but have a hard time recommending to people? And this question was asked by John on the Discord. The guy that asked most of our questions, Sammy, step it up. Uh, so, yeah. Not uh, hard time recommending to people. I wouldn't say I necessarily have a hard time recommending it to people. It's more so that I think that it's hard to recommend it to people and get get them to watch it. It's like, if I try to recommend people to watch a show by uh, Masaki Yuasa, for example, be that Ping Pong, even though... Oh. <laughs> Just as an example, it's a great show. Uh, visually, it's not actually, it's not even that bad. It's not even that bad. People kind of blow it out of proportions, but they decided to go with a very, very different art style for that. And there are certain instances where it just doesn't work out that great. Uh, and because of that, people will very often look at it and go, "Yeah, no, I'm good. I don't particularly like those kinds of shows." But, it's, it's funny you sorry sorry I gotta interrupt you uh, on that Tori because it's yeah. funny you mentioned Yuasa because on uh, mm-hmm. it, we're recording on April Fool's Day and last night on Toonami, um, the American television show that plays anime every once in a while you might say uh, mm-hmm. one of their April Fool's bo- jokes was showing a Yuasa movie from the early two thousands and it only Mind had game, right and it, yeah and it only had yeah uh, Japanese audio. There was no dub. So there was two reactions to it. And uh, this was all over Twitter and everyone was super confused. And I was like, well, clearly it's an April Fool's joke. That's what Toonami likes to do these days. Uh, The two reactions were, uh, what is this crap? And this show's quality is horrible. So... The, the fact that you bring up that it's hard time rec- uh, you have a hard time recommending something like a Yuasa work to people well especially new fans and even let's let's just say what it is most tsunami fans it doesn't even have to be new fans for me it can be <laughs> almost anyone well yeah I mean a lot of people just see it as, see it as bad quality and it's like no it's you, this is a common mistake where people mess up the uh, art style for animation. Well, yes, but and even some then, sort of it's u- like uniqueness. <laughs> even then, it's like the thing that makes that, especially mind game, so difficult is because mind game is not mind game is not poorly animated, or nor does it have a bad art style per se. But it it is highly experimental in its looks. Like it doesn't want to go for that typical moe aesthetic of of characters, just to kind of say, right? That's what most most shows do now, right? It you also has often been. Like uh, not saying not saying like he critiques people for using his style, but he has said it multiple times himself that that is not a style he particularly enjoys and doesn't want to recreate himself. Which is why you have things like Devil Man, which was very, which was you know really good on Netflix, and uh, it does not look like most anime. <laughs> yeah, and that's another instance of people just most uh, a lot of people confusing an art style and animation. Yes. At least Devil Man got popular enough. I know quite a few people that wanted to that actually decided to give that one a shot, mostly because of Netflix. But hey, whatever gives the U.S. more attention, I'm fine with it. If that happens to be Netflix giving him more attention, so be it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, nah, that is definitely for me. You guys? Um, I guess it's this obviously go to me. This this is an obvious question that that gears towards personal taste. And if you know your personal taste isn't, uh, let's call it... Okay, let's call it what it is. I, I like Shonen Trash, especially the battle Shonen Trash. So am I going to recommend something like Black Clover to somebody? Hell no. <laughs> because it's bad, yes. <laughs> because objectively, it's a well, bad show. Like, if the Subjectively, person, I'm having fun if with the person it. Knows, <laughs> if the person knows you have shit taste, wouldn't, would you still recommend? No. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, because then it then it then you're admitting embarrassment. 
I was about to say, why do that when you can recommend a, a, a better Battle Shonen show? At least, you know, some people claim it to be a better Battle Shonen show. But um, more, more than recently, actually, there's a show from the, uh, the winter season that I quite enjoyed, but I don't really see myself recommending to people because it's very unique. It, it has... I, t- I tend to like shows that have a plot, and maybe, let's call it, the show doesn't really have anything more than that uh, to offer at its crux. You know, and if you're not, and if I'm not convinced everybody would be into this plot, well then yeah, that would be harder to recommend than, say, a, a simpler show, such as Akage no Anne. That's an, that That to me is an easy show to recommend. Mm, I don't know. Too old. <laughs> well, <I'm> taking <laughs> age out of it. How about Come that? On. Too childish. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Oh come on! I it's don't not think it was childish. childish. <laughs> no, I don't either. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. I'm just trying to think of arguments people would have against watching it. <laughs> Two slice of life. <laughs> Two nothing. Uh, any shows that you really enjoyed? Hard one with me. Uh, Keijo. But aside from Keijo, <laughs> uh, Keijo is hard to explain to the person, and you know, if you explain to simple. In a very simplistic way, when they get to the power ups and like <laughs> fucking shonen powers being thrown around their butts, they they will get confused. Yep. Uh, I mean, a show I like it, I really enjoy it, but it is hard to recommend. I would say Comic Party. Comic Party is a trash. It is a pile of garbage. You don't need to watch that. You don't need to look at it. You don't need to search it. You don't need to know what it is. But it's bad. Uh, but I had a really, really great time watching it. I don't know why. Uh, aside from the shit taste, uh, you know, that is already known. Uh, I don't know why I had a, a, such a good time watching it. Maybe because I, I liked. Uh, but it's a bad show. I, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Even though if I want, like, even if I want to, to see the reaction to the show. Or, you know, see what they think about it. I wouldn't recommend it. Same goes to Kimono Friends. I would lo- I, I like to, to hear the, the opinion of people on Kimono Friends. But I won't go around recommending it. <laughs> because it looks so bad. So bad. It hurts sometimes. But that's the charm, Mickey. <laughs> that, is not the sh- that is not the charm <laughs> of Kimono Friends. Dude. <laughs> I can guarantee dude. you. Dude. Did you see the reactions when the wheels on that bus finally started spinning? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, it's so late. I remember that. <laughs> People were so like, happy. What the f- it is actually it was actually oh I, yeah, no. No, just no. Just 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 no. You should watch it, but you know, don't tell anyone that recommended that. <laughs> you heard it here first. Now everyone go watch it, but no one recommended it. <laughs> uh I did. So, JD, you want to take next question? Next question. Sure. Do you ever pay attention to the lyrics in anime OP, OP and EDs uh, when they're available? Of course, this is another John question. Uh, what are mm-hmm. some standout ones for you? For me, it's the lyrics to Psychopaths' first ED. Uh, for me personally, no. Simple as that. Now, when they do stand out, it's usually because it's something from, like, Man on a Mission, where they repeat uh, a lyric over and over again. And it's in English. And it's in English, so <laughs> that stands out. The uh, the Kokaku OP uh, stood out a lot, just from the uh, the beat. And again, that has another case of repeat lyrics in English. <laughs> see. I, I'm I couldn't think of anything. I can think of anything because usually I skip OPs and DDs. Only if I really, really like the, sh- the the lyrics. But unfortunately, this is the few cases apply. Uh, this is applied to few cases. Uh, at, I know that when I was searching, I it had I had this ah uh, this desire to rewatch Dark and Black because of the OPs and DDs. Mm-hmm. But oh, usually I skip the the OPs and EDs, so not really. When I when I pay attention to the EDs and OPs, it's usually 
how sad sometimes they you know they they, they port portray very very kind of very very sad uh, situations and usually they have this up bit this happy bit so like you don't know japanese and they are singing you're like oh they are singing something that looks very happy and you go go look up the lyrics and it is something very tragic that they're singing about like i i never understood that usually those are the ones who stand out for me yeah uh let's see here i mean i'm mostly with heki i usually uh skip ops and edis that's mostly because i listen to so much op uh, so much ops and edis like I listen to a lot of music by itself, so I'll, I'll listen to OPs, like, on my own time. Not so much when I watch the show, so it's like, I don't know, I kind of just want to go. Well, I w listen to the OPs and the EDs, like, once or twice, and then I usually skip skip from there on. Uh, there, are rare, there are some examples, but very rarely. I never skip Tank, for example, the opening to Cowboy Bebop, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's interesting, but uh, as far as... OPs and EDs where the lyrics stands out, uh, stand out for me. Uh, like, a lot of the time, there are... I can't really uh, remember a time where the lyrics in particular has stood out. It's usually, the, it's usually the entire thing, and of course, most stuff is in Japanese and whatnot, so that makes it a little bit harder, but I mean... There are there are examples, you know, for example, but not even necessarily openings. There are, but there are examples of anime music that has, you know, that makes me always pay attention to the lyrics and look at, like, for example, uh, Come uh, Sisa Todd from uh, the end of Evangelion, for example. That's a that's a song that I can't help but every time I every time I do it, I just have to sit there. I can't I cannot pay attention to the lyrics in that. It also helps that it's in English, but you know. <laughs> uh, so. But as far as openings go, I usually have to go out of my way uh, to look up lyrics, mostly because, you know, they're not available. Uh, so, yeah, I have to go out and, and I, I can't be asked going out of my way just to look up some lyrics for an opening that, unless, of course, I'm sitting there and listening to it again and again and again, then then, then there's difference. There, bleh, different difference. Uh, yeah, that's... That's that question. So, Hickey, do you want to take the last question? Sure. Uh, Meowth asks, Any tips for surviving the tidal wave of anime next season? Very simple. Don't watch anything. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the be this is the best I can do. Uh... Uh, I mean, I can, I, can, I can give out my awesome shadowing for watching 40 shows in a season. Uh, but I think it's too late to start planning for the, uh, usually if you, if you want to watch more than 30 anime per season and you have a life, uh, you should start planning in the middle of the current season. Like you want to watch the next season, you want, you have 30 plus shows in the next season. You need to start planning three months before the, the beginning. Or else you're gonna, everything's gonna get convoluted, and you need a, you, you actually need, need a shadow. Everything in your life needs to work kind of a Swiss clock. Everything has a, everything has its own time. You 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 know you have like an hour to lunch, some hours to do that, some hours to do that, and hour for anime. Uh, you need to know which time of the day the episode releases. Uh, you need to know, you need to predict if you're going to have some problems, like some private problems in the middle of the way. Uh, oh, there's 10 episodes. Uh, usually you have between 10 to 12 episodes on Friday. Uh, so, you know, you know that Friday is a is an important day. Uh, so you need to kind of prepare. Your friends want to go out. Uh, you, your father or your mother or your parents want, want you to do something, uh, to go out to do something. Recurrent stuff that you know the probability to happen again is very high. Uh, you need to take that in account and have a plan B for those things. Uh, usually on Saturday I have more free time, so if I don't watch on, on Friday, I can watch on the weekend, uh, on this and this time. And I, I, 
I and doing that, you also ha will have free time to do other stuff, play video games, read a book, or, or simply go out. That is, that is the the simplified version of my my planning for watching a lot of shows in one season. Yeah, my, mine's Simple, yes. yeah, mine's a, mine's almost the same as you, Hickey. Where uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta plan in advance when know when the shows come out. Uh, what I do is I set up like an Excel spreadsheet of all the shows I want to watch, uh, find out what day of the week they come out, and then kind of shuffle that around to my own personal schedule. So let's say, again, I, let's say, for instance, I, I know I have bowling uh, in the middle of the week, and then I have bowling on Saturday morning. Okay, so let's say, in the case of the spring season, a lot of shows come out on Tuesday. I probably won't be able to watch a lot of them uh, or let's say even half of them on that day. So I spread then those shows out across the rest of the week. Maybe on a day where there's no anime that come out. Say on a Wednesday. Just as an example. Um, so th th that's that's what I would do. You like Know that you don't have... It's not a necessity to watch a show on a certain day. But if you, uh, but if you sh shuffle the schedule, your own schedule around, uh, like you said, a, a, a clock, a well-refined clock, and stick to that clock, plan for the clock, then you should be fine. But it will take, it will take a lot of self, uh, self-discipline in order to do that. Huh, interesting. Yeah, uh, that sounds, that sounds like a good idea. As, as, if you're planning to watch a lot, that is. Uh, if you're like me, I mean, that some people would consider that I do watch a lot, but for my my set my set <laughs> time, I don't really watch that much. So I watch when I feel okay. like it. <laughs> it's uh, I don't really have a uh, like I have a soft rule set in place where uh, which is like I'll watch around five episodes. It's, that that's kind of been falling away as well now recently. But like I had a soft rule where it's like I would watch five episodes of anime a day if I had time. Uh, so it's just kind of stick to that the entire time. This usually just came. It wasn't a set schedule, but it was like when I'm done with stuff, like when I get home, when I'm done with eating and whatnot, and done homework and whatnot. Still, okay, sure. Now I'm gonna sit down, watch five episodes of anime, and then we do something else. It's kind of been falling away as well because I don't know. There are some days where I'm really feeling like watching anime, and there are other times where I'm just not feeling like it. Like today. I haven't seen anything today. I just haven't felt like watching anime today at all. Well, you had more I important don't. things to do today, such as talking about a very good show. Well, yes, but I that's, that doesn't happen until I mean, night for me. <laughs> I don't live in your time zone. Pretty Durabu Mamusume just came out, you know, just just so you know. Uh -huh. I don't care. You can, you can watch that. No. I'm I'm definitely watching that. Yeah, and if in a, to expand on that question, uh, if you if you are curious about like the winter season or the the I'm sorry I misspoke the 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 spring 2018 season, um, as as we do, we're gonna do a kind of a a preview in our next episode. It will be two weeks into the season, so we'll at, at least have a better idea of what's what's actually come out since there's so many shows, and uh, we'll also have our moving bar. Outlook as well, just for the the podcast sake. All right then. So yeah, but with that said, since the next podcast, we'll take a look at the ne the uh, this season, the spring season, upcoming season, uh, which will then have gone for a little bit. We decided to take the time this uh, podcast to wrap up the uh, winter twenty eighteen season because you know it's now finally ended. And it was quite a ride. Yeah, it was. It felt different than the few other seasons uh, that that had recently just passed, didn't it, Tori? It felt like an in-between season. Yeah, honestly. Well, that's it's, usually uh, the case with winter itself, but the I think the diversity in anime was a little bit more this season than the past couple. Yes, but still, I feel like there was. There wasn't enough of just shows that pers I personally wanted to watch. There was just kind of like, man, I'll, I'll check out that and I'll check out that. And I ended up being mostly disappointed, honestly. There wasn't... There were... The best show was... The best show for me was an ongoing... Like, was a continuing show and whatnot. And then, But, yeah. 
some fun some fun watches here and there, but nothing fantastic. Nothing stand out. For me at least. For you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I had to stop watching one month into the season, so I don't have an opinion about it. Maybe in June I can talk about Winter <laughs> 2018. Mm. Maybe. Sometimes life gets in the way. It Maybe. happens. It happens. Yeah. Well, Tori, why don't you why don't you uh, why don't you start us off with uh, with how we're gonna do this and and uh, any particular order? Sure. So basically, just kind of as a quick summary of our of our season and how we thought. I just I wanted everyone to kind of highlight their. It says I I said top three, but like I just wanted people to highlight three anime that they enjoyed watching, or maybe didn't, but still felt felt like uh, <laughs> felt like highlighting. There there is so, one uh, particular we're definitely gonna have to highlight on. <laughs> uh, well, you are. So good luck with that. Um, and yeah. So uh, I don't know. Well, Hickey, since you kind of gave out early, why don't you start? Why don't you let everyone down? Then we pick it up after. Wait, what? Why did I? Why did I stop watching the season? Yeah, sure. Some you said you only watched like you stopped a month in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm finishing college this year, so I have a lot of things to do. I know. Uh, <laughs> then I, I I thought like I'm gonna I'm gonna limit myself and <laughs> watch just the right amount of anime. Which Unfortunately, I you know I start studying and studying and studying. And I was like, okay, I can watch three hours of anime and and study four hours and then go to sleep 1 a.m. Or I can study six hours and then sleep at midnight. And I decided that for my for the sake of my future, for the sake of having a livelihood and keep watching anime, I need for now to chill and stop watching, concentrate on my studies, and then find a job when i have a job i can go all, all out again and you guys won't won't hear any word for me i won't be in the podcast from june to august because i'll be devoting all my time to watch anime so don't even try <laughs> uh, don't even it's okay try. Hickey, I, I know exactly how you're feeling when i was when i was uh, getting my degree um like seasonal anime wasn't even a a, a thought to me it was it was just school and and bowling that was that was it i mean I, I i devoted saturday mornings like a saturday morning cartoon show like i would get some get myself some nostalgia that was i mean it was just one piece in detective conan for me that that was it so i i know i know exactly what you're going through he is actually lying the fact is that he asked for recommendations this season and he doesn't like the recommendations he got so therefore he decided to stop <laughs> <laughs> He, no, oh, no, 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 he got, he got halfway, no, that no, Tor, we all know what happened. He got halfway through Death March, and he just goes, anime's dead to me. <laughs> true. <laughs> oh. Well, look, that would be true if I hadn't watched Isekai Smartphone before that. <laughs> we don't need because to bring that up again. Anime died for me. Anime, anime's dead from me since that day. Since the day I started since the first minute of Isekai smartphone, anime's dead. I don't give a shit. I'm just pissing in the with your Nokia 3100? <laughs> that would be way better. <laughs> that would be a way better show. Because he, he, he can at least throw the things at the, the, at the monsters. And that would, like, that would make him OP. Uh, but no. He, he, you know, had some anal sex with God. Yep. That is, anyway. Anyway. All right. Uh, then. Anime's dead for me since that day. Yep. So, no. So, Hickey doesn't even have a single thing he wants to highlight. Got it. Okay, then. JD? Nope. You want me to start then, Tori? Yes. Shall we? Okay. Um, so, instead of devoting podcast time to hating on Death March, because that was the Blood Pack show of the season, uh, yes, confirmed to be bad. Right, Tori? Yeah. We we all did <laughs> at least you and I did finish it. The the guys over at uh, Super Anime Super Show they uh, they got that jar of mayonnaise going hard <laughs> for the show. Um, so instead of devoting podcast time to that, I, I you know I, I decided to just pick the three shows that stood out to me the most. And number number one easily for me subjectively was uh, Kokaku. 
the um, I, I briefly mentioned this on other pod on a couple previous podcasts where it's it's an it's it's a plot focused show, and of course when you get an anime like this, the show's overall impact depends heavily on how it nails the ending. So for me, the the journey of the plot unfolding. Uh, getting to know the char- getting to know the characters and and how they're related to the plot and how they're affected by the plot in this moment. Um, the character designs were very unique. Each one felt very individualistic. Uh, I liked how everything unfolded, and naturally, the way the show ended on episode twelve, it uh it all led up to this one moment. And I'm just gonna say it as it is. It was a cop out, and I was heavily disappointed at it. Because for me personally, it was like a 10 out of 10 enjoyment show. No, it wasn't a 10 out of 10 by any means. It was probably closer to a, a 6 or a 7. And just like Hickey with, with how he rates, you know, a plus 1 for enjoyment. So, but in that case... Plus 4 for enjoyment. Pl- plus 4 for enjoyment. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it did not stick the ending. It wasn't even close. It was a straight cop-out. And it, it, it literally just... It's not like I didn't expect it. That's why I wasn't like visceral about it. Uh, but it 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 just shows the level of writing that we always see that we commonly see in anime, where you know, for example, we'll we'll we'll, we'll have a show that can say kill off characters or or uh, or have a set you know have the balls to have a sad ending. You just don't really see those kinds of, of twists very often. It always kind of cops out to a happy ending. And you just go, why? Why was that necessary? And that's that's kind of how I, I felt for the ending of Kokaku. But the uh, 1 through 11 and a half was very good for me. It was easily my must-watch show, but it wasn't the best of the season by any means. I don't know if okay. any of you guys... Hickey, you copped out, but uh, not copped out. You you uh, you bowed out to to more important things. But Tori, I don't think you watched the show, did you? <laughs> nope. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of people watched, watched it either. Five episodes. Did you get five episodes into it, Hickey? Yeah, I think I got. I most of shows I got like five episodes in. Aside from Slow Start, because Slow Start started earlier, <laughs> so like I was on episode eight, I think. Okay. What what did you what did you think of the start then? Five or six. Uh, the okay the first three episodes I I didn't actually like. Uh, you know it was a it was a unique story. I I can give it that. But it doesn't feel that how can I how can it unique? Doesn't it didn't although it looked unique although the premise was very unique. It didn't have the uniqueness feeling to it. So I was kind of, yeah, okay, I can watch it. It's not bad, but it's also not great. Uh, I don't I don't feel like watching the the, the adventures of a like a low low class family <laughs> uh, who can which can stop time. It, like I, I I wasn't it wasn't doing it for me. Then episode 4 and 5, they were actually very good. Especially when the the main character discovered, right, right, right. Uh, she discovered that thing. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, after she discovered that, and she was actually angry because they were messing with her family, the show got way, way better. And I, and by the things I I saw, especially the spoilery synopsis on Anime's Neo Network front page of impressions of each episode of which uh, of each series it looks like it got more of it it got a lot of more more action uh the characters were very fleshed out so i guess it got better the episode four was the the beginning of the improvement and seems like it was getting better and better and better and then you came like last week and said yeah no last episode wasn't that good i was like well so it improved, but it seems that it let it down at the end. 
Uh, I wouldn't say the show the show itself was a letdown, but yeah, it, it, the the ending should have gone a very much different way, especially with the with the with the light that it was that that it was put in from from yeah after that after that initial setup of the first three episodes. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's enough about Kokaku. Well, well, let's move on to what uh, what Tori has to say. On uh, my top pick of the well, actually. I'm not even going to start with my top pick, because that's boring. I'm going to start with my third pick. Uh, my third pick is definitely not some not something that people would normally normally pick, but I said, you know what? There was three shows that was uh, that was uh, fighting for this spot, which I have... Well, one of them hasn't even ended yet, but <laughs> that's kind of uh, sitting here. It is, and that was Violet Evergarden, which hasn't ended. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Oh, my God. Uh, the Antarctic show, I forgot the name. Holy shit. Place Further I'm, Than the I'm Universe. A place Further Than the Universe, that's the one. You're welcome. That was a nice little enjoyable <laughs> show uh, about going to an Antar- Antarctica and just, you know, challenge yourself sometimes. God, if, don't just live in your basement, me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Something yeah, you can nah, relate it's to, It's not even your basement. It's your mom's basement. True. Don't True. even lie. Tori, you don't have to go a place right. further than the universe. You just gotta go out. You just gotta get out of your mom's basement and go outside, and then you're there. <laughs> Damn, you're right. <laughs> I, why didn't anyone tell me? Uh, no, and uh, but the one that I decided, the one that decided, I decided, I was like, maybe I should take a step outside my basement. But then I was like, nope, right back in the basement. And we're gonna hide like killing bites, and uh, because <laughs> killing bites is uh, is an anime about uh, it's a battle royale type stuff. It's or yeah, where it's kind of just everyone fights everyone. Well, there are teams, but there's this tournament going on where these. Half animal, this animal therian tropes have just decided, well, not decided. There's a political uh, political organization that is controlling all of the economy in Japan, basically, and they have this tournament going on where they have uh, therian tropes fight uh, fight each other in what they call the killing bites. And uh, this time it's special because this time it's not just a fight; it's a fight to the death. And uh, we meet. Uh, uh, our main character, whose name I don't remember, and I don't care, he's not that important. Uh, <laughs> he He's kind of just there, but we meet Hitomi. And she is uh, she is a cute little girl who's about to get raped. And, um, what? <laughs> you no. don't uh, say. She's about, uh, she gets kidnapped by this, by this guy and his friends. Well, friends, they're not his friends. They just kind of, well, they just kind of asked him out. And he's like, hey, do you want to drive our, our van? And he was like, yeah, sure. I was like, by the way, we're stopping to kidnap girls to rape them. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, she gets kidnapped and uh, they drive to an empty place and they're about to rape her. And then he leaves and he's like, I don't know what to do. I wasn't. I didn't want to be a part of this. And then you just start hearing screaming and everyone dies. And he's like, what happened? And the girl, girl, fucking giant tits and fucking six pack at the same time. It's like, wow. Like, it's not even, she's not even fucking, like, giant tits, fucking really slim waist with six packs. Like, whoa. Fucking tone. Uh, but yeah. It's like... Uh, so he's like, oh shit, don't kill me. Turns out that she is uh, one of the Therian tropes. Uh, she is a... Rattel, which I've learned is apparently the best animal in the goddamn animal kingdom. Uh, nothing can fight it. And yeah. Uh, she ends up fighting a lion, which is the supreme champion of the killing bites. Because he shows up and she defeats him and as such gains right, right into the killing bites. And uh, they end up having to team up, and shit happens, and they fight, and have to kill shit, and tits, and lesbian scenes, and just straight up fan service and murder, which is what most people would say disgusting, but what I would say fantastic. <laughs> ten out of ten. It's the most ten, out of, like I described in the Discord. It's the most ten out of ten a show has ever seven out of ten, but it's really a three out of ten. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Tori. This, I like the, this I like is the actually a um, a show that I wish I would have watched this season because it looks like mm. it was just a lot of just nonsense fun oh yeah <laughs> it was actually nothing but nonsense i don't, don't remember nothing I, in I that show makes any goddamn sense <laughs> yeah i'm not sure if you remember but even like on its finale all over twitter at least all the people that follow the redley retrocast on twitter that would be at bowling jd or redley retrocast um Nice plug. People were people on the timeline because what <laughs> I, you know if you follow if you follow the cast I'll follow you back and 
a lot of a lot of the listeners were posting killing bites pictures and i just went into oh, discord yeah. and was like hey tori look at this look at this <laughs> i don't know what i'm yeah, looking I, at but isn't this fun <laughs> and i ignored you because that was from the final episode i haven't seen yet so i was like oh no <laughs> absolutely not uh yeah nah it's like that it's nothing in that show makes any goddamn sense so if you're expecting some sort of like well thought out plot or fantastic characters or any sort of I'm sorry you've come to the wrong place. This is a show that just revels in the fact that this is about nothing but murder and fan service. And god damn it is it good at it. <laughs> uh, I am definitely watching this show. <laughs> definitely. Uh, I can't wait for June. Oh. It was so much fun. Uh, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, I'm, I I'm like not, the I'm description. Not ashamed. And fighting and murder and blood and lesbian scenes and <laughs> Things uh, are like, oh, dude, there's a fucking and animal. I really enjoyed it. It was like, oh, yeah. one of the awesome. <laughs> one of the theory drops, she has a fucking ability that's like, uh, she secretes like an aphrodisiac so everyone gets turned on. And it just happens like, right, you're like uh, one, of the, one of the other theory drops, she's about to kill Rathel. And it's like, it's just like, uh, you're just, oh my God, is she really gonna, well, not obviously not. You don't, you think something's gonna happen, but you think like, uh, Hitam is maybe gonna break loose or something but instead of killing her she kisses her it's like what's happening and it's like oh yeah there's this other theron throwfair she has uh, the uh, aphrodisic ability and now they're having sex no literally <laughs> yeah i mean the only thing i know about killing whites is the the bunny girl oh yeah the bunny <laughs> who, girl who's basically almost rape slash kill every single episode of the series apparently well, not really like, every oh. single episode but often enough yeah <laughs> I mean, she is oh, useless. No, okay. She is useless. She cannot. She, she can do one thing, and that is dig. She loves digging, and she does that a lot. And other than that, she every time she faces an opponent, she can only do one thing, and that is run around. <laughs> it's like, no, don't kill me, no. And then she like she as she's about to get caught, like, wait, I can dig my way out of this, and then she does. <laughs> <laughs> awesome! I can't wait to watch this one. Oh uh, yeah, no, it's a good show. It certainly is. So yeah, follow. Well, we're going to go back to you, J.D. All right, so uh, the other show I want to highlight on is After the Rain. Um, mm. Ironically, these are two uh, Amazon Prime shows from this last season. Amazon Prime videos. Thank you, Art. Uh, After the Rain, wa- at the, the first half focuses on uh, the budding relationship of a young high school girl... Um, kind of crushing on her manager she works with at a uh, diner or cafe. Uh, the The manager's in his mid-40s. So, you know, kind of a... a uh, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? The... Um, controversial. Controversial uh, relationship <laughs> perspective. But the, the, the show handles it very well, um, where, yes, this is a young girl's love, and then on the other side, you have the forty-five-year-old who who kind of goes no, uh, looks at looks at this in a real light. You know, there there's a moment where the girl, you know, admits to him, um, you know, I, I I really like you, and he goes, no, you don't want to date me. I'm an old man. Um, you're still in your youth. Uh, look at look, you know, look at how society would look down. Look, look at us. You know, this this won't work. So they they have a lot of conversations like that. Um, they do go out on a date, and he he treats her with respect. He still kind of doesn't really see them as dating, while she, you know, wa- you know, in her eyes, wants this to be a thing. While the second half focuses on uh, their own personal—I don't want to say demons, but a a conflict in their life. You know, in in the forty-five-year-old man's case, he he. He's kind of having this regret that, you know, he's only a manager at this cafe. You know, he's kind of having not so much a midlife crisis, but kind of a self-realization of that. While the girl suffer, you know, she she was a uh, a track star athlete, and she got injured. She uh, ruptured her Achilles tendon, and she's kind of got to get over the fact that she needs to um, maybe get back into track or. Or reconcile with old track teammates that were, you know, that were at, at a time her best friend. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of flack the show's been getting for having such a drastic change in only a 12-episode show. And how one one half focused on 
this aspect while the other half focused on another. Um, you know, maybe it should have been flipped. Maybe the script should have been flipped around where it, it could have led up to the moment of the budding relationship uh, instead. But, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, the, the, as you watch the show, you may, you, you may think one thing or another, um, you know, it kind of ends on this very just kind of bland note because of that. Uh, but the show isn't ruined by any means. Uh, every, every character looks very much outstanding and unique. A lot of, a lot of jig jagged, sharp edges on the character designs, uh, kind of something you'd see in the, the late nineties, early two thousands. So a lot, a lot of things stand out. It, it's it's a it's a romance show that was actually pretty good and handles relationships in a more mature light. It was it was a well it was a well written um, show in that regard. So that, that it was a good experience. I don't know, man. There wasn't really a relationship to speak of. There was a girl that crushed on a manager and then kind of stopped. It stopped there after a certain point. Well, that that's kind it of that like, halfway point like the, uh... flipping that. It did. Well, yeah. Yeah. But that's what I mean. Like, there was no relationship. She liked him, and he doesn't want to deal with that. And he's like, okay, let's... Like, I, 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 he decides to go out with her eventually, yes. But it's most like to let her down, in a way. Uh, not, not in the sense that he's trying to ruin the date or anything, but it's like, kind of, just to show that, like, this... He, he hopes that this was going to show that like, this just isn't going to work. Their interests are too, too different. And, uh, but she starts to, you know adapt to his stuff they start becoming they start becoming friends which you know is in, in and of itself is is fine um but it's kind of like i feel i feel like for the subject matter it feels like the writer just kind of got cold feet eventually he was like okay I, I yeah i kind of felt that I, way I like as well um but maybe that maybe that was for the better you know, maybe know. maybe that's how it should have been. Since it was a, a a more mature adult, and this this what could be just a a girl going through a tough time and trying to, uh, you know, have her life go in this direction on purpose. You know, it, it could have been it could have been taken another way. What the show did really well was definitely its use of cinematography and uh, and body language. Like a you know there were. It, there wasn't a lot of, say, internal dialogue or even dialogue being spoken on screen. It had a lot to do with, say, shifting shoulders, uh, piercing eyes. Um, uh, there, there's a moment in, I want to say it was episode three, where uh, there's a lot of symbolism used with rain, naturally, but where uh, sounds... Every episode. <laughs> well, just about every episode, but it, it, the different uses of how rain played into a part, what I'm... what I. What what stood out was definitely I believe it was episode three where, uh, she's she's confronting the manager, a, a, about more of her feelings towards him and all of a sudden the rain stops it's deaf quiet you don't hear anything she leaves but you only hear her footsteps and uh, when the when the ash of a cigarette falls off you know kind of like he's ending his thought process of what what happened. Uh, why does this girl like me and I'm, you know, I'm a middle-aged man kind of deal, then the, then you start hearing the rain again. You know, the show does, does a lot of things along those lines and that's where, it, that's, it's moments like that, that's where it shines. Uh, mm. I, don't, I don't know I if you picked up like, on any of that. End. <laughs> no, I did. I definitely did. I got a bit annoyed at their use of rain because I felt like they would, like, I get, I get it, it's, it's in the title, but it's like, it was always the rain, like at any given opportunity and I was, that was a bit annoying, but, it's fine uh and it's like uh but and as well i didn't personally like the ending mostly because it's just like what it's one thing that yeah sure maybe that maybe it's the intention that they wanted he didn't particularly want to go down the route of like let's have a uh, quote-unquote forbidden romance and let's instead focus on this other thing but it feels a bit like a cop-out to me and it also doesn't help that personally speaking the quote-unquote personal demons that they start dealing with dealing with eventually they were incredibly overblown and un, un, uh, uninteresting to me. So, yeah. Nah. It was it's, it's, an it's, okay it's, show, but it let me down at the end. Yeah, it's interesting that we both took two different uh, perspectives on, on it in the end, but I, I, I did think it was, a, it was a show to highlight on from the season. Yeah, nah, definitely. It is yeah. one of the more standard ones. Uh, But yeah. Alright then. Then I guess it's my turn again. And, uh, my second one is uh, that I wanted to highlight, which is also going to continue on into next season. You see a trend. Uh, 
is uh, Darley Fra or Darling in the Franks. And uh, this is a show that I was looking forward to before this, e- this season because, you know, just Studio Trigger and A1, but never mind A1. Studio Trigger, they return, yeah, they're, cool. doing, they're doing their stuff again, they're... They decided, uh, yeah, no, I was I was looking forward to this. I know multiple people in Discord was looking forward to this. I know Joe was definitely looking forward to this. And uh, I believe it was it's... in both you and I, Tori's uh, top five looking forward to the season when we when we did our uh, winter outlook before. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Nah, I was very curious about what it would do, and uh, what it is is we follow these we follow the uh, this group of children who are uh, stuck in, or they they are. Uh, they have to pair up together to uh, uh, pilot the Smax because they need the uh, uh, they need both parts. They need both a a man and a woman, a man and a woman, and uh, in order to do it, and then they need to assume the correct positions, and uh, they need to combine. Uh, well, not not in that way, uh, but re- yeah, really in that way. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's definitely a. Uh, I see a lot of people describe it as a horny show, and I do agree. It is absolutely a horny show. They they really did enjoy, especially early on. I really did enjoy kind of hammering down that fact that, like, yep, this is absolutely an allegory for sex. And don't you forget it. <laughs> so, and they have to go out and they have to fight the uh, Klexosaurs, which are these monsters that keep trying to invade them and destroy the plantations that they live in. Uh, as far as we know, the world has been destroyed uh, by the Klexosaurs, we have to assume. Uh, and, uh, yeah, these are the only... Uh, don't you side me. These are the only... Uh, <laughs> These are the only things we really know because these children, they are obviously locked in these plantations. They, they can't go out to defend them, but they will, we're basically entered into or get to see in this system where the kids are being fostered to serve and protect the adults, which are the leaders of society. And eventually they will get to kind of migrate into the, into the cities and whatnot, where they get to live their completely separated lives, even if they have partners quote-unquote like you know you and i would be like like you and i would uh, eventually have our own partner like uh, uh be married to someone for example uh but in this case everyone is separated like you get to live together but you don't really live together you don't really talk together like it's kind of just your you know a par- partners in name only uh this group we focus on they're an experimental group um and uh yeah they're they're not like the other groups they're there are major differences they are more childlike they have they learn more about emotions and whatnot and they're mostly being used for testing and just whatnot and uh obviously we uh we have uh yeah we have zero two the uh mm-hmm. the the special one uh which is a girl that finds our uh our main character and she uh they end up partnering because she cannot. She is special. She cannot uh, ride with anyone for more than three times without killing them. But for some reason, the main character of the show, he can ride with her. Uh, more, uh, more. He could ride with her more than three times. For some barely, reason, barely, but he could. <laughs> uh, well, that's kind of being touched on right now, actually. Mm. Um, yeah, it is kind of. And uh, because you're not paying attention, that is not the fault of the show, JD. <laughs> oh my god. And, uh, Come on, Tori. Alright, alright. I'll, well, I'll, I'll, let, you I, fi- I'll ha- let you finish and, and then... <laughs> I, I have to say that. You had a you had a fucking moment there where you did where you were questioning things that were directly fucking addressed in the show, in that episode. Well, the show shouldn't be so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, Then I would boring. pay attention more. No. Anyways, <laughs> it's uh, basically, these uh, we're learning about the society and where uh, these... Yeah, these kids are fighting for the survival of the adults, and uh, the world has something has happened to the world. We're not, we don't know what. All we know is that the world that everyone is dead. These plantation kids and the adults are the only only thing left alive. Claxosaurs are running; they are ruling this world apparently, and they come to stop them. And most stuff is currently still shrouded in a lot of mystery. We don't really, really know what. Is gonna happen so far, but there's a whole other core left, and I am very much looking for looking forward to see. The first core spent character building and world building <laughs> for the most part, but uh, <laughs> don't laugh at me. The first half was spent character building and world world building, and uh, you've kind of just got to see the state of where everything is right now. 
Yes. Cool. Shall shall awesome. I uh, shall and I put my two cents in, or Hickey, do you have something to say? The first five episodes were nice. <laughs> See? That, is, that is it. See? Yes, Jenny. Uh, all right. Um, I'm very I'm very curious to to know what you enjoy about the show, Tori. Before I before I put my two cents in, actually. Uh, what I what I enjoy about the show. What I enjoy about this show is uh, I enjoyed its portrayal of, uh, portrayal of the characters. I love how we get to explore a whole bunch of people with absolutely nothing locked in a lock that is locked in a world that has been destroyed and uh, or has where everything is dead and has uh, to uh, live in a city where they are forced to serve. Well, I say forced, but they're not actually even forced. They are serving to protect the. Uh, uh, protect the adults and the leaders of these plantations, and uh, for the purpose of the purpose of which is obviously, obviously to keep people alive. That's all they need to know. But uh, what what the uh, council uh, is trying to uh, and Papa is trying to achieve, we don't know yet. Um, but they're definitely using these kids. They're experimenting them on them, doing different stuff. We got to see more kids now. We're getting experimented on. Differently, they are getting the parasite the vaccine, which is what these kids are getting on. They're getting that a lot earlier now, and uh, they're definitely using using these kids. What I find incredibly interesting is how it's portrayed in that the fact that because it, it needs to be believable, right? These kids are being I have have to fight to basically for the survival of like an elite group of people. It's just you can count them like one hand. I think there's like five six people, maybe six. Uh, and quote unquote the rest, but technically the vast majority is out there protecting uh, is our kids, and they're out there protecting these uh, these adults because the kids that eventually grow up and get to live in the city they are even fewer than there are in the council. Uh, there's not that many, and uh, at least as far as we know, we haven't seen anyone yet. Uh, and uh, yeah, Sarah too, she has more on multiple occasions uh, noted that the cities are dead even though they look like they're full of life but we haven't seen it we have only met two people um and uh they do note that most kids die we have yeah like i said stuff that uh so you like it sounds it sounds like tori you like the the setting and the and the 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 characters you like the setting the the characters and the and the concept of perspective in the show that's what it sounds like to me right now that is definitely that is definitely where it is right now because we haven't gotten the entire story yet, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Fair enough. For I, I get the feeling that's why a lot of people like the show, um, especially from our our uh, our followers on Twitter. Uh, I, I I've been I I'm I'm one easy to please when it comes to say a battle shonen or what have you, and that's what these that's what the first say six episodes kind of war was just this big glorious setup for can this kid ride with this one character zero two who ki- who kills everyone she rides with and it you know it was it was a it was an epic build-up but it was a bit it dragged on you know it, it felt like a lot of this this first as you call it core uh was just a it was just a drag to get to a 12 episode mark because as Trigger does, as they notoriously do, a lot of their shows have a 12-episode kind of episodic set, and then it goes into the story for the second set. Um, you know, we saw it with Little Witch Academia, with a lot of just character pieces and focuses, you know, that... Uh, we saw it with um, even Gurren Lagann, uh, even though that's Gynex. Uh, Kill a Kill. You know, they. You know, this is no exception. Um but I did. But this this show feels like it's it's even more so in the fact with what it wants to do. It it, it, dra- it drags a lot of that epicness along uh, along the snails. The the uh, the battles seem to not have any stakes at all all the time. Um, it's more focused on the characters, as you say. My problem is the characters themselves being more focused on tropes. Oh no. <laughs> every every character seems to be you have the main character who's a self insert you ha- you you have the rest of the cast who's just trope 101 that's the way i take it um 
And I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. Otherwise, the otherwise I wouldn't be outspoken the way I am. Because I have had conversations with other listeners about this. I was dragged into a chat yesterday talking about not only, you know, the podcast and, and what they thought of it, but also Darling of Franks, Violet Evergarden, you know, a few other shows as well. Uh, the The world building is fine, I guess. I just wish the show would make it more exciting or interesting instead of just having this bland dialogue be- behind this one person we meet. And it, it was, I don't know if it was a case of poor translation or poor writing or what have you. Um, there's a moment in episode 10 where where this is unfolding. Yes, the world building's important. I don't dispute that in any way. I just, I, I just, I just think it should have been handled a lot better, or even written better, for that. Now, episode twelve was fantastic. If the if the whole show up to that point was what episode twelve was doing, with with a character focused piece integrating into the overall plot line, uh, I feel that Little Witch Academia had a lot to do with that. Um, I just don't think Darling and the Franks is doing any of that. It don't, it's it's really only done it in the opening episode and the twelfth episode. <sighs> JD, 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 JD. See, now, what, from what I'm hearing from you, and this is also what I see people don't like the show, I get the I get the impression that, uh, and you say this a lot, you bring up uh, excitement a lot. I feel like the problem stems from the fact that it's not exciting enough. A lot of it's after the fact, I wish it was more exciting. And see, and here's where I disagree, because there's a couple things we have to take in, uh, remember, and this is where I say the dialogue becomes important. They have a lot of dialogue where, between each other as well, where they kind of explain stuff. Like, for example, you can see with one of the characters how they they want to fight for the uh, adults. They are incredibly stoked to be able to allow to lay down their lives for these people. And... This is where I feel like the show will have to put on the handbrakes. Because uh, if all it was was constant battling with the Klaxosaurus, which there's been actually quite a lot of battles with the Klaxosaurus, but... Yeah, the same ones uh, over and over again. If, <laughs> yeah, because it's the Klaxosaurus. Uh, and uh, they have, in order, like, in order to do this, there needs to be a reason why they would trust these people and why, and as we are clearly seeing, that trust is kind of slowly being withered away or getting... Uh, uh, stretched on, but it wouldn't make sense for them to trust the par or the uh, the adults as much as they do if all they did was being sent out to die. Because as far as we know, and we've seen this multiple times where it comes back that people did die. They don't even know that people die in a lot of cases. But that's not what the They've show focuses on. It it, ter- it it decides to have no. whole episodes where it's like, oh, we're going to the beach, or we're gonna have we're gonna have the yes, whole dormitory as, a, as this as this teenage angsty. Uh, argument. They are teen- because they are teenage gangsters. That's the difference between them and all the other ones. All the other ones are super engineered soldiers that has no emotions. They were the only ones that were allowed to keep their emotions in order to test it to see how that would work. Clearly, it's backfiring. <laughs> but that's kind of that's the <laughs> entire point. Uh, and that is why. So, like you said, you mentioned the beach episode. I think the beach episode is absolutely fantastic, as it is the most vital piece of piece of world building because this is the first time we get to see the outside world we get to go to the village that is nothing it is there is absolutely nothing there and you get to realize the fact that this is not they are not an exception this they aren't the first people this seems like it's been going on for a while you also get to you. This is also where you get to realize that when they properly start talking about stuff like because you know like see so two has been the entire time is she has been very uh, adamant about, you know, kissing the main, uh, the main character. I'm not disputing anything. Like I I'm not disputing the world building. I just think it's being handled you horribly. I, I I completely disagree. I think it's being handled fantastically. Well, I haven't seen world building this well done this well in a long time. Oh, God damn it! I can I cannot be the, the guy saying I agree with someone. Hickey. I'm dying inside. Hickey, you agreed with JD last time, you agree with me this time. That's, that's the rule. <laughs> the last I podcast. Agree with Cody. <laughs> usually, usually, usually when it comes to world building, well, but you, you two blow everything out of proportion, usually. 
So well, like, according to you, yes. <laughs> but that's what that's what different opinions are. <laughs> that that is what different opinions are. That's that's all that's happening here. Tori Tori really likes the show, and I just and I'm just speaking my my issues with it. It's it's no, because, I like, have nothing against what Tori's saying. JD JD's one is on one side say world building is horrible. It is handed horrible, and then Tori's on the other side saying, "I completely disagree." This is fantastic. Yeah, but we, this is the best I've seen so far. We also we I, also explained why we think oh, that. I'm though. scared. <laughs> you guys you guys are getting too passionate over <laughs> darling the Frank's world building. So I wish you could I wish I was watching it just so oh. I know if you guys are actually blowing out of proportion or Knowing is, you, Hickey, you, you really you're gonna end it. up. You're definitely gonna be the guy in the middle of saying it's like it's okay. It's all right. That's where you, you. That's where you usually end up in these situations. Like one person is like, "Oh, this but is I, bad." But the other I, person I, goes, "This I, is I, good." I then you're be, like, "Yeah." I, I will be the that's okay, handled well. <laughs> so I'll agree with you, or the that's okay. But, but Hickey, the, not that great handled. So I would be with JD, and this time it is. Excruciating, not be able to agree with someone. <laughs> I guess. Oh, so I'll I'll just go back to my idol master All right. as you guys keep talking. Tori, ah, you do that. Tori, is it is it fair is it fair to just say we'll we'll, we'll uh we'll, we just got to move on? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay, I think I've said what I want to say. Yeah, but yeah. M- so, me too. JD, you're number three. <laughs> okay, it's not Death March, as I said. <laughs> oh. I just, I just want to, I just want to eat some crow on this one because I was very outspoken uh, over and worried with Violet Evergarden. I think we all were when we did our our winter outlook. Yeah. Um, Violet Evergarden for me began incredibly boring. It it focused on episodic. To me, it looked like nonsense at the time. Um. And as the series went on. You know, as Kyoto Animation likes doing, or at least attempts to like doing, is the 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 subtle the subtle the subtleties in in its plot development and uh, character development. Uh, Violet Evergarden is no exception to that. So I try I tried to more or less give it a chance. And yes, I still thought a few episodes at the beginning, if not the first six, were okay at best. Um, but then episodes. The, the episode arc of seven eight and nine occurred uh, I believe that I believe I have that correct where everything kind of came together uh, a full character emotional breakdown um, you know I, I was I was talking to someone who kind of put the the show in a different perspective because the show supposedly focuses a lot a lot on PTSD I personally don't see it especially in those first six episodes uh because i don't you know i don't know anybody in the military personally uh i was never in the military um i've never experienced any i've never met anyone in person with ptsd so i didn't know what i what it if i was to say did i know what i was looking for no um luckily the show does come to fruition in making that more obvious for, say, someone like me in that middle arc. Uh, I do still have a problem with the show's concept of time and how things roll together in that sense and what's important over another, uh, you know. So I still have an issue with, with some of the episodic directions that the show is going or what it has done, because there's only one episode left and... Uh, I, I, I really like the way the show's ending. Um, it's probably one of the best, if not the best, Kyoto animation show, at least I've ever seen. And I'm, I think I've seen all of them to this point now. Or at least all the major ones. Um, nah. The show's beautifully animated. It's it's on a scale of itself. You know, you, you would say what stands out animation-wise in 2018 so far. I go, okay, it's Devilman Crybaby, Violet Evergarden, everything else. Um, but yeah i'm definitely eating crow on the series uh it is a very good show it's it's very well developed um the character of of violet is is showing more emotion you know i was very worried that it was just going to be another show focused on another bland kind of robot like character and it hasn't done any of that it's 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 
come together into into what could be the best show of the season depending on this last episode but even with without watching the last episode this is definitely one of the one of the best shows of the season easily definitely it's i just want to point out that if you go back a few episodes you know beginning of winter 2018 you're gonna see me saying jd you don't know what you're talking about this show is about emotional growth and she's going to realize she has emotions and learn about then and oh look at that that happened oh my yeah, god yeah well i also what i also shock. did say i was worried oh. that it was going to be an episodic show with with like the last 30 seconds be this emotional development and the show has done that but that didn't my worry was that wasn't going to make it good you know it was just going to make it a kind of a, a cheap said, cop out for writing no. and luckily the sh- the show even doing doing it that way and ex- the execution was much better than than uh i i had predicted so yes i'm eating crow on it Icky. absolutely good good can you say i was right you hickey you were right you were right thank you thank you so all right then that's i mean that, Tori, you're watching Violet Evergarden. Do you have similar similar thoughts at all, or is it? I mean, no. Uh, like, okay. you don't the, think the it's good? I, no, I do think it's good. Okay, well, uh, that, the, difference, the difference is because well. I didn't go through that swing. I wasn't like, it's not that good. And okay, at best, and then it's now good. I think it's been decently, like, decently good the entire time through. I particularly mind the structure of the story as well. I I happen to like uh, stories that kind of like to portray uh, uh portray narrative beats differently and even kind of uh play with time like sequence of events i mean for fuck's sake i like concrete revolution that shit is all about <laughs> playing with fuck yeah, what time is when uh but like uh yeah nah it's so for me it's been it's been a genuinely good ride uh, as far as things with, like, you know, the PS, uh, PTSD and whatnot, it's like, I can see it. I, at least I can see the idea behind it. Like, again, I, I've seen people argue both for and against that whether or not this is proper portrayal of PTSD. And it's like, uh, and I can see that, but I feel like, again, proper portrayal of things like this, anything like this, is kind of hard to do unless you either know someone directly that, it ha- that it has experience with this or you have experience with it yourself. Yeah. Well, I even so, had, I know. even had a pretty, pretty, uh, a uh, pretty good conversation with, uh, brains from trash pandas podcast. Uh, we were talking mm-hmm. and he was, he was putting the, he, he was the one that initially started the, the PTSD question and what I should be looking for in the show. And that was a big help too, I must say. And then, and then I looked up other articles uh, that have been written on the show, and there's a lot of ex-military people w- that suffer from PTSD that, or or even that know people with PTSD that uh, commend the show for uh, its portrayal in it. So, who are, who yeah. who am I to 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 disagree then at that point? Yeah, it's, and it's like I've seen I've seen people who suffer from PTSD. I went to America once, and I saw a bunch of ex-military people who were running around in the streets and firing at the sky with their pretend weapons. And it's like, you know, so already there kind of just gives me the indication that there are, I assume there are multiple levels to PTSD. Not everything is super obvious. Yeah. (laughs) That's not to say, you know, I I, I did mention that it's not to say that I still don't have some issues with the show, but the issues are kind of more along the line of getting closer to the minute stage at this point. Mm Mm-hmm. So... Heck, he was right. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'll one, say it one again. One thing I want to know when I like when I when I watch the show, there's there's two things you can suffer when you go to wars and whatnot. The first is PTSD. Uh, the other one is the shell shock syndrome. Oh yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to see if I want to see if, if she, uh, aside from the PTSD, if you can see her suffering from the the shell shock. I think that would be interesting. Or like someone suffering shell shock. Like the <clears throat> the boss. Because he was in the military as well. I don't know. It would be interesting to see someone suffering from, from shell shock syndrome right. as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, one one but I don't know. One don't tell last me. aspect I'd like to hit on uh is I have been watching this show in German dub. 
And uh, from a linguistic side, um, you know, I have switched over to, luckily Netflix Germany has also has the English language options just in case uh, I don't understand a word or I'm curious to see how it was translated in English. Um, the, the, the way people either refer to Violet herself, the character, uh, or the way she addresses people is very much different. It's differently handled in German than it is English. And I think it's, it's actually uh, a very much superior. I think in this case, this is one of those cases where I can say that the German translation was, was, uh, uh, easily or at least much better handled, um, from Japanese. Um, so uh, the best example I could, I could say is there, there's an episode where, um, she, where Violet has a job where she goes to a kingdom, right? Tori, you remember this episode? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. and she writes a letter for a, uh, a princess. Um, the, uh, the, the handmaiden, if I'm not mistaken, it was her, refers to Violet in, in the way the German language was working in this, in this moment was, she goes, she calls her three different things, and, uh, depending on what she's referring to and in the moment. So there's a moment where she refers to her as a doll, then there's another one where she refers her to an instrument, then there's another one where she refers her to a human. Uh, and and it was very much obvious how she was differenti- differentiating between the three. Uh, while, and then in that, and then I go, oh, that's very, I, I kind of picked up on that. And then I switched to English, where it was just translated as doll. Yeah. So that's the best case where the English translation just kind of doesn't work for the writing of the show. Yeah. Now, that's definitely a problem with English English sometimes, though. It's like, yeah. English can oftentimes be very, very cold when they translate something. It's like, there's emotion put into this word that means so much in this language, but then it's translated to English, and it's just like something completely different that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, and that was... Like, it, nah. it, this. I, I, it's been a long time since I've seen a show where the language played such a different... It played on such a different level, uh, and and German was was a very good. It it was very good that I I got to watch the I I decided to watch the show in German. Otherwise, I would have I would have missed out on a lot of the uh, the writing quality in the show. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I think it's time to move on. <laughs> I think we've talked okay, about okay. Violet Evergarden, and uh, Fair yeah. So let's just go on to my my last one. Then I'm just gonna hit this pretty quick because I think you've heard me and everyone else there for that matter. Talk about this show Fact. a lot. <laughs> and uh, that is Ancient Magus Pride. That is my favorite show of this season as well. Shouldn't be shocking. It ended fantastically and just kept being kept being good all the way all the way through. Like it's a it's just a nice kind of like moody dark fantasy story. And I I was on board from I was on board from the OVA and just it's, it's kept me on board since the uh since the show started, and, and uh, now Joel keeps bug- uh, bugging me, saying that I need to read the manga, and I probably will. Well, not right now, since I've just finished the show. I'll let it get ahead a little bit first, and then I'll read it. But yeah, nah, it is. It's a fantastic show, honestly, and it is. I ended up giving it a nine in the end, and yeah, it's it's been a long time since. Well, actually, no, it hasn't. I gave uh, My Hero Academia season. Uh, Season two or nine, but uh, anyways, it's been it's not often apart from with the with the exception of very recently, it's not often that I end up giving such high scores to seasonal shows. That's I think the last time I gave very such a high score or higher score to a seasonal show was when was when I got into anime back in like twenty fourteen. What about like then show <laughs> rock ago? I haven't seen that yet, so um... and I didn't watch that re- that seasonally. Yeah, and then you so... didn't like March comes in like a lion, so. I did not like March Comes in like a line, no. So yeah, that answers that. that is, <laughs> yep. That's basically all I have to say on uh, on that show. Like I said, we've talked we've talked about Ancient Mega Sprite at length, so I don't think I need to talk. Yeah, about we've kind of gushed on that show quite a bit, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I can confirm Tori's thoughts. It was it was a it was a good show, well written. Um, 
I th- I think the ending was a bit weird, but the show was weird, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it's in style with the rest of the show. <laughs> uh yeah. I mean it's not it's not even the end. The manga isn't finished yet as far as I as far as I'm aware, so it's just where the show ended. Yeah, I'm curious if it was just an arc that ended or was it an original ending? That I don't know. Yeah. Uh Joe has not told me, so I don't even know if he's actually seen the ending yet, but I assume he will tell me. And for those joining us for the first time, when we when we say Joe, uh, he was an he was a uh, a member of the podcast. Yeah, he's also the uh, he's also the like the guy that created our Discord that we're on. So you know, kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, but that that basically wraps up uh, Winter twenty eighteen, and now we're all very much looking forward to uh, Spring twenty eighteen. Except for Hickey. Uh, but the rest of us are. Aw. <laughs> I guess. I was maybe. left behind. <laughs> uh, well, that was almost, almost so, an hour on the winter recap, but that's okay. That is okay. We tend, tend to go for three hours. Uh, yeah, it kind of goes in line yeah. with our, our usual thing. So, uh, yeah, if we if we went long, um, you know, we... We don't really have a time cap on how we how we talk about things. We always take I, I like I like to think that we take the necessary amount of time and give everything uh what we what we need. What we what it needs. Yeah. What it needs. There we go. Got my words. And <laughs> sometimes we mess up and go a bit a bit long on things that don't really need to take that long, but you know, it happens. Lessons learned. Lessons it. learned. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so well. Discussions. Okay. Yeah. That that's kind of that's kind of how it goes. Unscripted discussions and whatnot, you can get sidetracked very easily. I know I get sidetracked a lot by trying to talk about something, and then a bunch of points just keep popping in my head, and then I kind of end up going all over the place and kind of lose track of what I was actually trying to say. Well, it's funny you bring uh, that up. Luckily, uh, I went I went old school here, and I put pen to paper for all the thoughts of what we're going to talk about. Oh, mm. yeah, because Tori, you were kind enough to do the agenda today because this is your special episode. Uh, I very much nice appreciate that. It was it was nice not having to worry about <laughs> worrying about that this time around. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna say though, one of these days when he has time, Hickey needs to have his own special episode because he hasn't had one yet. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I uh, had my two hard hips. So. <laughs> okay, you know that's true. That's true. But it's been a while. This is my second. So you know, one day when you have time, Hickey, you get you'll get I, your own I, special I, episode. I, 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 I don't mind. <laughs> you will think, you I'll will get your own special one you will get your own episode and something. like it okay. <laughs> uh, but anyways let's not uh, let's not drag this out anymore <laughs> now we're going to go into the main topic of today's podcast and uh, we're going to be talking about a little thing that people might have heard of you might not have heard of and even if you have heard of it you probably don't really consider it as anything and that is a little thing called the world masterpiece theater so does anyone of you know what what the World Masterpiece Theater is? Yes, I learned yesterday. Good job, good job. I'm glad to hear that you guys did Thank your you. research. Uh, yeah. Thank you. World Masterpiece Theater is a uh, programming block that uh, uh, it's a programming block that basically went from uh, 19. Uh, shit, I should have cleaned this this up before I started this. Did I not put it in here? Sorry. Uh Basically, it uh, it started in 1969. There it is, and uh, it uh, ended in 1997. So it went from 1969 to 1997, and then it kind of came back in 2007. But it hasn't it hasn't done anything since 2009, where it did uh, a show called Konnichiwa and Before Green Gables. So that was the last thing they 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 did, and nothing else has happened before uh, or since. I mean. So, this was a programming block that was specifically targeted at uh, children and women. Because around this time, uh, children and women were kind of... I mean, not in, obviously not all the time, but uh, they were kind of a neglected demographic when it came to uh, television and anime. Uh, because this was the time that was dominated by especially sci-fi. But a bit of Mecca as well. Mecca was kind of making, making a statement, especially for the 70s and 80s, especially. Um, yeah, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And those were kind. Those shows tended to be ta- to target boys, you know, and because boys were kind of boys and men because they were considered like the prime 
the best demographic to target because they would be the ones who would go out and buy plastic models and whatnot as well and not just watch oh. the show. Gotta whereas, buy those battleships, man. Yeah. <laughs> whereas children, whereas like children, there weren't really anything for them. And then uh, it's not uh, like children and women weren't seen as a uh, marketable demographic because children won't buy something because they don't have money. And women, they're busy doing other things. <laughs> so, um, what uh, what World Masterpiece Theater did was they they wanted to believe in this uh, children's demographic and females, and uh, it worked because believe it or not, little girls and par- parents will often buy stuff for their children. I know, shocking, and uh, li- and uh, little girls will actually also buy stuff, uh, and that is. Things like, you know, wands or whatnot, especially with a show called uh, Heidi Girl in the Alps, which kind of takes inspiration from some magical girl shows, which was a part of World Masterpiece Theater. Um, yeah, but uh, let's see where where were we? I've been fucking completely set uh, put off by this. Uh, it's a it, okay. What okay. Ha- um... Uh, yeah, it, let, let's touch on that for a second with with how uh, World Masters Theater uh, s- kind of started revolution. It w- it wasn't just about sci fi anymore. Um, it's it's I, I I think it's important to note that yeah, it it was about the demographic. You know, it, it was almost like it was a dedicated time slot where, uh, let let's say for example in nineteen seventy uh. F- Five, you know, um, Yamato was airing. It's not when it first aired, yeah. but it was kind of repeating. That mm-hmm. was kind of the time block where fathers would sit down, sit down with their sons, and watch that show together. Followed by uh, Heidi, um, where a mother would sit down with their daughter. You know, it got it got that that other half of the family, you might say. And as you as you said, Tori, that that was then opportunity to expand the market it wasn't it wasn't just say this heavy japanese sci-fi thing anymore because it, it did go worldwide with this yeah. with this goal in mind because it started with you know if you want to go way back it started with tezuka in in the 60s you know he had this vision where you know uh it wasn't the anime wasn't just about movies anymore it wanted it, you know it wanted to be tv you know more more produ- more to producible more uh to make money yeah. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure where you want to take this conversation from there. Well, I mean, kind of, uh, I just want to quickly touch on what you said. Because um, Tessica, uh, for those that don't know, Tessica, he, he's kind of a big deal, both in the manga industry and also in the anime industry, as he was <laughs> one of the ones who first brought anime to TV. He saw TV as a, uh, as a way for anime to make money. The problem is just that making animation for TV... Uh, is incredibly expensive, and it would require. Uh, he he claimed that it would require a team of three thousand animators to do. Now that's obviously just not possible, especially not back then. There weren't. You could count on one hand, or you could count on your both hands how many animators were currently working in Japan. So um, you know. <laughs> the the uh, the uh, the metric I pulled up was there wasn't even half that available. Yep, like in the mm-hmm. entire country. There was not, it was not looking good. So, Tessica kind of came up with this uh, idea of a limited animation, which he calls it, which is a technique that has stood, stood the test of time and it is true even today. And this is what we like, what anime fans of today like to call the uh, cost cutting measures or time saving measures, which is, you know, where they'll not animate something as well as it could have been in order to save time. Uh, he basically did that with all of Astro Boy. Not just certain segments, but almost the entire thing. It's it moves, although mostly just in keyframes, but it moves. <laughs> but that is just that was just simply mm-hmm. what they had to do in order to get it out. Yeah, not in everything should out. have been like Yamato and Heidi of the Alps. <laughs> yep, that's kind of the thing. Uh, Yamato was the sci-fi uh, version of the ones that wanted to challenge this, and World Masterpiece Theater, and especially with people like you might have heard of some of these. People like Hayao Miyazaki and Yoshiyuki uh, Tomino and Isao Takahara were three very important people for this programming block. They kind of wanted to challenge that idea of animation for TV has to be limited. So 
especially with Heidi of the Alps, they decided to just go all out and produce a timeless classic. Which is kind of weird, considering the fact that their target demographic is children. But they really wanted they really wanted this, and they did. Miyazaki stated that Heidi, certain episodes of Heidi had more than 8,000 uh, cells of animation. Yeah. That is considerably um, more than anything else at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Heidi, if you... You can find episodes on Heidi on YouTube. Uh, me personally, um, Tori, I don't know if you remember this, but when I first started my quest, this was one of the shows I wanted to at least check out. And yeah, uh, yeah the the animation and the art style are just on a level that is insane. Let's to, to put it simply. Um, now, now the the story structure and episodic nature is a is a totally different animal to touch on. But uh, the 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 point taken from this is, you know, whether it be the rolling hills uh, or the, uh, the the rolling the rolling mountains in the background, uh, you know, the changing of of how. Heidi herself would move or take off her take off, you know, her heavy winter clothing, you know, as she starts sweating facial expressions. The 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 show wa- was incredible for the, for that, but definitely should have been unsustainable and and turned out to be true in that aspect. Yeah. Uh Heidi was not a commercial success in any in any regard really. Uh, it didn't. No, that's <laughs> that's not to say that it was. It didn't do poorly. It did. It didn't do terrible. It wasn't like they went bankrupt or anything, but they didn't make as much money as they were hoping to. Uh, so well, it you wasn't know, really their but, goal to make, let's say, money. It was more or less to to get that other demographic involved and create create a. Uh, I think the word is um, kind classic. of a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. in, in, in indus- that, uh, an make anime, a point. anime industry, they wanted revolution. to make a point. <laughs> they want to make wanted, a point. They wanted to make a point. Take is absolutely right there. They definitely made a statement with the with their show and many shows to follow, and uh, kind of just to Heidi was so uh, Heidi, while not being very commercially successful, it was so critically successful that it ended up being even brought over to the West and dubbed. And this wasn't exactly common at the time. And it's one of the reasons why, especially for, you know, for people that got into anime uh, a while back, anime has for a long time had the stigma of being children's cartoons. And you can kind of blame Haiti and a lot of shows shows like that for this belief, because those are children's shows. But those were, those were what a lot of people had seen or knew about. Oh, sure. Uh, and in order just to kind of like, when I say, I say Hi- Heidi would be a a show like Heidi would be a timeless classic. And that is not just a statement. That is a proven fact. Nissin Cup Noodles made a commercial in... Was it... I think it was 2017. Uh, and uh, it's either 2017 or 2018. Where they use... Where they are literally directly referencing Heidi Girl on the Alps. And this is to appeal to teenagers of today. Not teen- not people that used to be teenagers. This is to appeal to teenagers now. So... Yeah, even today, that show is still relevant. Yeah, they um for fun uh, uh yeah fun fact is in in at least in German speaking countries, even in my own experience when I was living in Germany during Christmas time, the month of December, uh, television channels still play Heidi during that time of year, uh, to this day. Yeah. Um. Even mm-hmm. when I was over there, I was like, "What the Heidi? Like this is an anime." And even the host family I was staying with, they go, anime? I was like, yeah, Japanese production. And no shit, they looked at me and go, oh, I thought that was a a, 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 sw- a sw- product out of Switzerland. Yep. And I started asking around, I was like, yeah, you watch huh. Heidi? And everyone goes, yeah, uh, that's been around since the 70s. Um, you know, my father or mother watched that show. Uh, yeah, Germany produced it, right? And I'm like, no, it's an anime, it's from Japan. No kidding. <laughs> And this is kind of a, uh, uh, yeah, this is kind of a thing with World Masterpiece Theater because obviously it's, it's not called World Masterpiece, it's not just called World Masterpiece Theater because they wanted to appeal to the world. It's called World Masterpiece Theater because they are adapting world renowned stories. World Masterpieces. <laughs> yep. But, no, but uh, not necessarily. I just kind of want to clear up something that I forgot to mention, and that is uh, World Masterpiece Theater can be divided really up into two ways. And that is, it used to be, before it became World Masterpiece Theaters, it was called Kalpis uh, Theater, or K- 
Calpius Comic Theater or uh, Children's Theater or Family Theater. This was because, you know, for their family orientation. And for people like me, uh, who's yeah. from Europe, I would, uh, I, like, I could point to something from Calpis Comic Theater, like Moomin, uh, which was huge here in uh, Northern Europe. And all, everyone thought it was finished, because it is. But the, <laughs> an, the uh, animation is not. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's kind of, it kind of goes to, like, it's been around a lot. And around the uh, 75, it changed name to World Masterpiece Theater. Uh, and it's kind of stayed with that. I've had different sponsors, so it's kind of, or not really. It's got one sponsor. And it's like, uh, what's it called? It's called House Foods World Masterpiece Theater. It was called that twice, and another two other times it was called just called Masterpiece Theater. Well, I know, I, I do know that um, when it changed its name to World Masterpiece Theater in, I believe it, yeah, it was shortly after Heidi. It was shortly yeah, after it Heidi. It was in 1975. Um, when they started producing or showing uh, 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother, which I've actually um, spoken about before, is a World Masterpiece Theater show. It was sponsored by a drink, like Calpis yeah. Soda. Yeah, mm -hmm. Calpis. Yeah. Calpis is a, is a beverage brand. Yeah. Brand. And, and uh, Calpis continued that into World Masterpiece Theater for a while as well. Hmm. Yeah. Weird enough, they didn't get their name on anything, but sure. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, like you, 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 they, they did. I believe they referenced it as the drink in uh, Three Thousand Leagues of, of Search and Mother, but they didn't like blatantly uh -oh. advertise it, say on the bottles. Yeah. Okay. That I didn't. I didn't know that. I believe that. Thank you for doing true. the research. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. Nah, and I mean, just kind of give it like a short little reference of just what's been adapted as well. It's like we've obviously mentioned movement, we mentioned Heidi, mentioned uh, three thousand leagues in search of mother, the Swiss Family Robinson. You also have stuff, obviously, like the one we're talking about, Anne of Green Gables, A Dog of Flanders, and uh, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer. So you know, again, just kind of, just kind of, just kind of hammering down the point that this is like these stories were. I'm not going to say destined for success, but it's not. It's not like they adapted just you know. It's not like they were just rummaging around trying to find something and hoping that it would hit home. They were really going for this by hoping, by, you know, picking stuff that people really knew and wanted in hopes that this would succeed. Yeah, and each each story seemed to focus on a different region of the world, you know, with he Heidi mm -hmm. and in German-speaking countries. Uh, uh, Swiss Family Robinson kind of looking at an island perspective. Um, Tom Sawyer being American. Anne of Green ba Gables being Canadian. Very, uh, three thousand leagues in search of mother. Italy and Argentina, like. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, no, it was, it was very. It's a very been a very interesting perspective, and I definitely know myself. I definitely want to dive more into world masterpiece theater at some point. Uh, but so far, I've only seen one show from world masterpiece theater. Well, technically two because I have seen Moomin. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that was when mm. I was a kid. Uh. Yeah, also kind well, of. Well, it's funny. Just... It's funny you bring up being a kid because Tori, you're European. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, in the Hickey, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Um, I personally, I'm not European. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, if you <laughs> didn't realize, I'm not from Europe. Okay, you uh, used to be way back in the day. <laughs> yeah, way, way back, back before in you were born in the 1500s. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Uh, what, I, what I, the question was um, was going to be? Uh, I personally was not aware of any anime or world masterpiece theater growing up. It wasn't until I moved to Germany. So Hickey, my question is: in in South America, did they show world Mas masterpiece theater on TV at all? Uh, when you they when you were showed up. two of the shows when I was growing up, no. Uh, because when I was growing up, there was the another explosion of Japanese animation. Mm -hmm. So you know, Captain Tsubasa and most of eighty shows they were re, uh, they were uh, rebroadcasting it on the two, on the two thousand. So Captain Tsubasa, Sensei, uh, uh, Sailor Moon, those shows they were okay. exploding. So that it was yeah. the second so, generation. They, okay. Yeah, but in the eighties and I guess beginning of the nineties. 
they showed, I think, two shows from Ward Mass Space. The Ward Mass Space, like Ward Mass Space theater, was very popular in Portugal. Actually, the Portugal had, I think, twelve, thirteen shows, uh, actually dubbed in in Portuguese and you know, uh, broadcast in TV. Brazil, not really, because when the world masterpiece start coming here, like start uh, begin to to go on television and so on, other series, more than series, starting started to come in as well. Uh, so it was kind of out of place. The world masterpiece was kind of out of place, especially because people like the the television always advertised anime as children's show. So if you get a if you get a very classic book, make an anime out of it, mm-hmm. and put it to compete with Sailor Moon, it's gonna lose to Sailor Moon. So people were preferring those modern, more tropey, like modern tropes, modern modern tropes, and more 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 than story anime, uh, not the the world masterpiece. But I know for a fact that some of those went on television. Okay. Like at least two. Okay. Uh, well, that that just speaks how successful globally uh, World Masterpiece Theater was. But I I I don't ever recalling because I asked my I've asked my parents like, hey, did you watch anime growing up? But my my parents are are uh, on the older side of say kids my age or people my age. Um, so they they said no. Uh, so I I can't confirm whether. I, I'm sure World Mass Priest Theater was played in America at some, one point or another, but I never, I was never aware of it or or seen it um, as a lifetime anime fan. But when yeah. I, as soon as I moved to Germany, uh, uh, they had their own version of of Toonami, or you know, you might call it. Uh, World Masterpiece Theater was still playing over there in 2005. Briefly, it didn't have it. It wasn't like it didn't have its own block, so to say. It was just they would just run a show. Uh, and then when I was there again in college in uh, 2009 or 2008, um, there was a block plane for it by itself. Uh, I do remember that very vividly. It, uh, you know, Swiss Family Robinson was playing before Inuyasha. And uh, then another one would play after Detective Conan in One Piece. You know, and I was, I was entranced by it. So I, I've seen bits and a lot of bits and pieces of world masterpiece theater and i always watched it. it was it was a good way to learn learn the language and and get something out of it it was it was a, a type of anime i'd never seen before i'd always seen a lot of the battle shonens and, and what have you yeah uh, th- so yeah that's I feel my like, take that's my my personal I feel like history that's why it. yeah i feel that's why it's also kind of important to mention it because like i mean don't get don't get me wrong sci-fi and all those early anime, they they obviously have a huge part. They are one of the they were what they were the more financially successful ones. They you know they were what was necessary for anime to make money. If they didn't exist, well, people like uh, Miyazaki wouldn't have even had a chance to attempt this. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, it's like it is one of the things. It's like it's it's kind of important to remember that like while financials while stuff being financially successful is important to the studio and the people making it. It's not the end all be all of creating popu- popularity. That's why you know these guys, uh, people like Mushi Productions, who were involved v- at the earliest, but they were quickly replaced by a studio called Suio Aso, which was succeeded by Nippon Animation when they made their own their own actual animation studio. Right. Uh, so like that's like Dave's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, Jesus, what the. Uh, they did was they kind of always pushed this idea that critical acclaim can be very important, especially if you want to get this out to people, right? Because let's be real here. It's kind of hard to sell a show to somebody by saying, you know, even if you look at something, even if you look at today, like it's hard to sell people on one piece just by simply saying, well, it's popular and makes a lot of money. Right? <laughs> like people look, people just look at you and go, like, okay, good. Cool for you. <laughs> cool for them, I guess. Right? You, you're not going to sell people that, but if you can, if you can cite the people, say, you know, like fucking, like acclaimed people saying that this is really good, you got a, you got a bit of a, you got a different standing. You know, people will sort of go, oh, really? <laughs> so, 
So yeah, they kind of decided to go that route, and World Masterpiece Theater has just been a success yeah, for a while yeah, when, until they lost sponsors. The, the important, <laughs> you know, the importance of it going globally, uh, what was, what what you could argue, you could make the argument that before World Masterpiece Theater, anime was really just in Japan. Yeah. Um. And then the scythe, you know. You can't just say I, I don't I think it's safe to say you can't you know as commercially successful as you said the, the sci-fi genre and all those anime were uh, without world Ma- masterpiece theater you, would the global scale have happened um, wh- or would something have come up you know would something else have come along to to get it out globally I don't know that to be sure but world masterpiece theater was an intricate part of getting anime uh globally for sure yeah and, um well let's just yeah, kind of yeah, definitely. Put, let's just kind of put this thought uh, thought that i just actually just come on top about this real quick as well just imagine even a lot of these like more financially successful japanese titles like the yamados and whatnot when they made it over to the states how did they usually make it over through uh bootlegs not through tv right or any of that they were they were bootlegs Acquired illegally, you know. So. Yeah, bootlegs, well, horribly, again, horribly uh, subbed or dubbed, um, uh, or even like the entire narrative was changed, as we saw in Macross. Yeah. And that kept happening a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but when World Masterpiece Theater, it was actually brought over and dubbed, <laughs> which was kind of unheard of, especially for foreign. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, foreign animation. Definitely, especially like when JD, like JD, talking about. Uh, Heidi and you talking about Mumi. Uh, people think it's like people think it's not anime. People think it's not Japanese animator. They think it's something local. Uh, yep. so like you know, putting yourself in like nine, 1969 or like nineteen the seventies, the eighties. Uh, reinforced. This is a, a retro cast. You didn't have Google. You didn't have com- like you you had computers, but you didn't have the, the the easy way of just typing a few words and finding the meaning, uh, the story, the history behind something. So, you know, even when anime was on television, it was just the, the same, ha ha, Japanese animation, cool, clap, clap. You don't know the tropes, you don't know the culture, you don't know the language, you don't know anything. So it was kind of confusing, but seeing something hitting so close home uh if you were in one of those countries uh dissipated in one of the stories uh you would get interested in japanese animation and maybe wow. seek out to more and more and understand the other japanese animators uh, animations who didn't portray your country uh so yeah. like it is it is interesting like maybe it was just like this little sparkle that made anime go more global in the 80s and 90s. I was the, the first one, like the first ones. Uh, it was very local. You didn't, you didn't need to understand the Japanese culture to like an, an, a Japanese animation, uh, which is a, it, it is kind of a barrier. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of the things you, you need to know just a little bit, but it's still a little bit of Japanese animation to actually to fully enjoy a show. Uh, but in this, in those cases, in those stories, you don't even need to be a local from the country, but you just need to have the book. If you read the book, if you had like Anne of Green Gables, you 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 not necessarily need to be on Canada to find the book and read the book. You're gonna understand the story. You're gonna like the story. You're gonna enjoy the story. So it is accessible. It is culturally accessible. Those, those the enemy, the enemy, or uh, anime, not enemy, the enemy <laughs> on world masterpiece theater. It is hard. Yeah, I'm gonna, hard. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put this out there, guys. Um, okay. With the with the level of of quality that world masterpiece theater strive to put out, be it the art style. Uh, be at the mostly level of writing that we that you see in the shows and the meaning behind it all uh, would 
would a studio like Kyoto Animation, as my example I'm putting out there, uh, a, a studio that likes using a lot of subtleties in its narrative and uh, its character development, without World Masterpiece Theater kind of setting this this standard and bar, would we even see a studio like Kyoto Animation uh, exist in the way it does today? I, do, uh, I definitely do think that's hard. That's kind of hard to answer because technically Kyoto has their own inspirations. But again, we're we're essentially talking about you know the things that paved way for a lot of stuff. So right, yeah, no, I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily think you know well again it's always hard to say but no i do think it the landscape would have been very different and while you know you can always make the argument well if they didn't someone else would have and maybe that's true uh but you know i don't i don't i don't know it's... if because of the people involved with world masterpiece theater i don't know if that would even be the case because with with people like miyazaki and takahata and tomino kind of honing their craft during their time with uh, masterpiece theater. I I don't even know. I think it. I I don't think that uh, Kyoto Animation, as my example, I said before, would exist in the same light. I don't think. Yeah. The, I don't I, think the techniques used would uh, would be a thing today because the the direction that World Masterpiece Theater went and and how how it strived to hit this market and uh, and all the um, all the other aspects that we've touched on during this podcast. Yeah, I, I just, I, that argument of someone else would have done it, I don't think that would have been the case. No, I, I think, definitely think there's a lot of people that would disappear in that case because it's like, you know, this show that you can actually target other people than what is the considered the main demographic at the time. Just because everyone wants to go for this one demographic doesn't mean that everyone have to. <laughs> there are usually other other demographics out there that might be underrepresented underrepresented and those are usually the way to go uh, if you want to get some if you want to get something out there so yeah no it definitely has paved the way to show even even not necessarily for the QA, but like for a lot of people to just show it like don't be afraid to like target some uh, target a demographic that might appear smaller to you right now you never know it might grow <laughs> so yeah there's it definitely pushed away a lot and I kind of just have to point this out in case there's somebody that doesn't understand because I find it very funny when we especially mention that uh, Yoshiyuki Tomino was a part of this in incentive because for those that don't know who he is, that's the creator of uh, Gundam and uh, he also has the nickname of Kill Them All. <laughs> Kill Them All Tomino. Yeah, I wonder and, if he, I I wonder if he got that... a lot of that inspiration from his time in World <laughs> Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> uh, Maybe. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, one last thing I want to touch on, uh, if you guys don't mind. Yeah. is it's it's interesting the correlation of time on when uh masterpiece theater ended in the in the mid 90s mid to late 90s was essentially that generation had grown up and were no longer you know they they moved on with their lives they were no longer interested in say anime and that and the new generation um was more interested in you know the the screamy shonen, ca shonen characters, the battle shonen, because because oh, yeah. that's kind of when Dragon Ball and everything started, and uh, the fact that uh, you know I'm honestly surprised that World Masterpiece Theater lasted as long as it did, especially being Same. yeah, I, I'm shocked it didn't end in the mid '80s. Yeah, no, I mean you're definitely onto something because one one thing that is basically a given, although it took longer time it took longer back then and it goes a lot faster now nothing lasts nothing will be the top dog forever there will always be something new that with people's interests change the audience change and that's kind of why i say why i think world masterpiece theater is so important because it showed it basically showed that in a time dominated by sci-fi you could focus on something else and you could get away with it and then you know eventually they kind of got hit by the same thing they got all of a sudden, you know, Mecca started ramping up, Shonen started coming out, and the voice, you know, the voice demographic kind of got put back into the forefront, and it's like, whoa, okay, people are, and even girls, sir, some girls were into Shonen and whatnot, like, so they were just kind of gravitating that way, and it's like, well, I, I guess we lost it. <laughs> it's like, you can yeah, never, yeah. you can never stick to one idea for forever. It, it won't last. Right, yeah. No, it's, it's, um... It, if I didn't start my quest 
uh, and just happened to do a little bit of research and and watch some wa- fully watch a couple World Mass Priest theaters. Uh, I I definitely would feel um, kind of not remorse, but uh, regret. Regret's the word I want to use. That I I wasn't exposing myself to such not only an important part of history. Uh, I would be missing out on such an important part of just the just the the history in anime. Yep. Uh, and missing out on good shows, naturally. Oh yeah. Um, of course. Yeah. That's what it comes yeah. down to. <laughs> that's that yeah. that I mean that's that that yeah. Tori, you're right. It, it does come down to is the show good? And yep. It's not called masterpiece for no reason. <laughs> mm-hmm. For sure. Uh. I definitely think we've hit we've hit a lot about World Master Theater now, so I think it's time to move on to uh, talk about Akagi no Anne. Click. But just, <laughs> just before before I do that, I just want to mention one last thing, and that is if you're interested in learning more about World Master Theater and you don't necessarily just and you want video to go with it, I would highly recommend checking out Anime Every Day's the masterpiece that checked out that sorry the masterpiece that shaped anime. Uh, there's a video where he goes over. A lot of a lot, a lot of the, uh, things we've talked about in in more detail and not as disjointed as this ended up becoming. Oh, I'll have to ch- I'll have to <laughs> check that out, Tori. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good video. I liked it. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, Akagi no Anne. I liked it. I watched it for my quest. I really enjoyed it. I definitely uh, wanted you guys to check it out, and you decided to do it for the podcast, which even better for me. <laughs> uh, I definitely, I definitely caught JD with all those pictures of the backgrounds. I know that for a fact. <laughs> well, I mean, uh. I have seen World Masterpiece Theater, and this was like, uh, this was like one of, I think, maybe two major shows by them that I that yep. I haven't seen any of 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 of. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. And those backgrounds got you into it, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and we even and we even put out a a kind of a poll to the community of. You know, what 70s show should we watch? You know, we had Future Boy Conan, um, which is a Miyazaki TV show. We had, we had Anna Green Gables, and I believe we had Time Boken, another uh, major 70s production uh, that, that kind of, that major impact. And um, the the people voted for Anna Green Gables, so uh, instead of doing, because it's World Masterpiece Theater and, you know, it's not along the line of the episodic stuff that... A lot of the '70s put out at the time, or even the '80s, uh, we have to watch all 50 as opposed to just say 25. Just kind of the the more or less a rule, I would say. Um, yeah. We haven't had the need to invoke the rule yet, but no, we had to watch all 50 for sure, uh, and we gave our we gave ourselves ample time, and kind of manipulated yeah. some of uh, what shows we would cover to get, to give priority to a show like this, and and. Uh, God damn it! I'm glad we did. That's good. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Now, Aka- basically, Akagi no Anne is uh, follows the, is the story of well, Anne. She is uh, she is an 11 year old girl at the beginning of the story uh, with a vast imagination and an incredibly short temper. She will go from extremely happy to very sad at the drop of a hat, and it can be over the <laughs> minutest of details. Uh, she is an orphan, and, uh, yeah, there's no family. Feel sad. <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> and, an uh, orphan but... from Nova Scotia, I believe. Orphan from Nova, or, yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know that much about Canada, so. <laughs> well, they do, they do uh, touch on it from the beginning. She, she, uh, she no, came from I Nova Scotia. Yeah, no, yeah. I just don't remember that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, what, what ends up happening is that she is getting, she is taking the train to meet up with uh, her new adoptive uh, adoptive family, or that get picked up by uh, by them. So when she when she arrives, uh, steps out, she you know uh, a guy, an old man named Matthew, ends up uh, uh, coming along in his ho- in his horse and cart, and he to pick her up. And to his shock, or to pick up someone, but to his shock, all he sees waiting on the platform is a little girl. Which shouldn't be, because they were going to adopt someone, but they were going to adopt a boy to help on the farm. And uh, Matthew is very awkward and cannot talk to women at all. Um, so <laughs> a, go- a, good, a good point to make early on, that's for sure. 
Yeah. So, at first he kind of thinks to himself to just leave her. But he's also a very nice old man, so he can't. He has to, he has to talk to her at least. He has to ask what she's doing. So when he walks over to her and just kind of blurts at him and he's like, Oh, you're the one who's here to adopt me. Oh, I'm very glad. And he is just being completely overwhelmed because he cannot handle this. But he does end up taking her home. And uh, Matthew is a single man. Uh, like I said, he's very bad with women. But he lives with his sister, Marilla. And together they, ru- they run that farm. And when he returns with Anne, Marilla kind of uh, blows up on him because, again, yeah. they're not <laughs> adopting a girl. They he they want they should we're gonna adopt so he could have help on the farm. It needs to be a boy. She cannot help on the farm. Matthews, you know, like I said, he's the nice man. He kind of he's like, well, yeah, but she can help you out. And, but Marilla's having none of it, so they want to send her well, back. I mean, and yeah, it is. I guess you know we're not narrating everything that happens, but uh, the first episode is called uh, Matthew Kerbat is surprised. Yeah, uh, but uh, but also. It is not only because he's surprised to see a girl waiting for him on the on the train station, mm-hmm. but because when they are going to Green Gables, uh, he talks to Anne, and well, he doesn't talk, but Anne just don't stop talking. She, <laughs> so like she goes about the the trees and the nature and naming stuff, and you know, talking to him about you know her imagination and stories she thought about. So he thinks like, oh. You know, it might not be bad to have her around. Yeah, yeah that is an important uh, part to, that's to why make. He, it, that's it, why he tries to say, like, oh, you know, we we can keep her because she's an interesting child. Yeah. You know? uh-huh. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, um, e- even upon that initial meeting uh, where he he's very confused, he's shy, he, he's awkward, uh, and just starts talking about, you know, whatever she sees. And it's always in this vast imaginatory way, kind of like a as as I put it, as as we were kind of just glossing over the show and talking to each other uh, before the podcast, uh, as we we're watching it, it was like she 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 emits essentially a human stage play, as I put it, you know, yep. even when I believe it was the um, uh, the train, not the conductor, the um, the guy who runs the the train station. And he's just kind of hanging out, and he goes, "What are you doing?" And she goes, "Well, no, I'm fine here. I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna imagine." Uh, she sees a tree in the in the in the in the background, and it's in full bloom. Um, yep. And she goes into this whole imaginatory stage play on on imagining her playing under it, and and because today is a glorious day, she's finally gonna have a family. People want her. Then Matthew shows up, and you know she he doesn't have the. He doesn't have the nerve to just, or nerve, um, I guess, Guts. confidence to just tell her flat out, we're, we're not, you're not who we're looking for. Uh, so he decides to listen to her and she just keeps rambling on and on. And this is, this is such a good introduction to who Anne is because Anne is, Anne is a, Anne is an orphan. She comes from, a. uh, a sad background, but the the show doesn't need to show us the sad background. You kind of get that feeling based on how she's acting. It's very out of the norm. Uh, everything is fascinating to her. It, it it and and you yourself, the viewer, are also fascinated by this and kind of put off. Uh, yep. But your curiosity wants to know more, and that's that that just show and it shows through Matthew as well. Yep. That is definitely that's definitely correct. I, I just have to mention when you mentioned that that she was like a walking stage play in the Discord. Do you remember? I, do you remember what I said to you? I don't remember what you said, but go on. I said that was a very that was a that's a very inter- interesting way to interesting way to look at her, and I'm obviously referring to what happens to her later. Right, right. In this series. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I thought about my own phrase <laughs> later. I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah. And and that was, that was and, and, and before before we go on, I do want to mention. That this, as with every episode, we do spoil. Uh, at we 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 go slower, you know, as a as a pace. We go into a lot of detail for shows. Generally, um, we're not totally going to do that with this one, but this that we do spoil these shows. So, uh, yeah. it, you know, the closer we do get to the end of podcasts and whatnot, there are going to be the ending will be spoiled and what have you. So be be wary of that, listeners. 
We're going to talk about stuff a bit differently this time instead of just narrating each episode as it goes. Because it's 50 episodes, it would be kind of boring. Right. But anyways, like to where I was to kind of just some... What happens is uh, Morello does end up taking uh, Anne back to... Uh, or to, uh, yeah, to the one who they, they contacted for adoption so that she can kind of take her back or look for somebody else to adopt her instead. And there's an old woman there. She is kind of interested in her and uh, in Anne, but she is very, she's very harsh towards Anne, right? She kind of, uh, Anne has told Marilla and Matthew about a bit about how stuff has been for her. Um, and when they meet her, this is kind of just more of the same. It's like, you're not, a, I just need somebody to help out with my family because I can't take care of them all by myself. But you're not a part of the family. You're just, you know, kind of like hired help, but adopted. So, you know, basically <laughs> free labor. And, um, you know, she's kind of being very rude to Anne and uh, Marilla is listening to this. And even uh, even though she's hard, Marilla is also actually very kind at heart. And she gets annoyed by this. So she kind of just, not being rude or anything, but she kind of just interrupts them. And she said, hold on here. We, we never said that we, we never said that we were for sure going to have somebody else adopt her. We just said, we just said we weren't sure. And it, of course, ends up in them taking, taking Anne in. And as such, the story takes place because when this is a story that takes place from Anne's when she shows up, she is eleven years old, and when the show ends, she is seventeen. Uh, the story is also structured so such that the first, I don't remember exactly, but around halfway, like around twenty-five episodes, almost, it's her. It's just her first year there, and the rest kind of goes a lot faster. And although my maybe hearing that can sound like wow, what terrible pacing, it's be- it's with purpose. It's because her first year is the most exciting year. That's when everything is new. After that, you know, it's a lot of the same. So to kind of spare you that, her every day going to school to hang out with the same friends, learning the same things, you know. Yeah, I definitely. You, don't I, need that. you know, Tori, it's good. It's it's funny you mentioned like pacing and and how the show uh, handles it and. Uh... Yeah, the uh, initially hearing that, uh, one might think that is t- that is bad. But yes, as you said, there is there is purpose to it, um, and it's to the level of of the the writing and and uh, how the show per- not yeah puts everything in in kind of a, a different perspective than than what you might see today in anime uh, in anime today, um, and that is definitely something that I'd like to touch on later with you guys for sure um after we go over more or less more of the show Mm -hmm. yes so one of the things that happens in her first year is that uh before this before she even starts school um she ends up meeting uh well she wants to make friends obviously but this being the time and you know she doesn't want to just make uh, a friend tori she wants to make a bosom buddy a bosom buddy, yes. She <laughs> wants a bosom buddy. A very, very special friend. Um, his friend so special, they can not just be called special friend or best friend. No, they're bosom buddies. And, uh, but, you know, this being this being the case, this being the time, houses aren't, it's not exactly like now where you have a lot of streets and you can have, like, lots of people living on top of each other and, like, hundreds of people in the same street. Uh People live kind of far away, so oh, especially in but, uh, in Prince Edward Island, where this where the show takes place. Yep, and uh, but you know there is uh, not too far away. There is a girl living there. Her name is Diane, and Diana. Uh, Anne is dreaming about the day that she gets to meet her and hopefully become friends with her. Uh, and eventually they do, and they do become friends. Shocking, I know. Plot twist. <laughs> How could this happen? They even end up becoming. Dare I say it? Bosom buddies, <laughs> <laughs> special best friend, uh, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. It is very interesting how Diana got so captivated by Ames' personality and imagination. Uh, yeah. I guess everyone, everyone in the show gets so captivated by Ames' imagination. Uh, but you know, Diana's is is it is an, is an interesting case because. She had never found someone with her age, the same age as her, with that imagination, uh, with that personality. So she was yep. just getting pushed around by Anne. Uh, she found her amusing. So it is what she found her. Uh, Diane found finds Anne amusing, and you know because 
obviously Anne's, uh, well, sorry. Well, yeah, Anne and Diane's uh, Diana. life circumstances are, are very, yeah, no, Anne and Diane. Uh, Diana, yeah. Uh, their their life uh, circumstances they are very different, you know. Diana comes from a fairly well off family. She hasn't had she's had her family. Like I'm not saying amazingly rich or anything, but she hasn't, you know. She isn't an orphan. She isn't. They're not poor. They have what they have what they need. So, you know, and she has been raised on the on the Christian way, such as what, you know, Marilla and Matthew, especially Marilla, tries to teach Anne, but... Yeah, I think it's also Anne... important just to just to quickly note of, of the time this takes place in. The the, yeah. the the late 1800s, where it's still horse and carriage, yeah. you know, cars aren't a thing yeah. yet, train... Especially in uh, in, in this area of Canada, where, where it's, it's pretty much rough to just get around, in general. Yeah, oh yeah. No, for sure. And you know, like I said, Christianity is a big part. Oh Marilla yeah, Marilla tries to teach tries to teach Anne all about religion. But as you would expect from a child, and especially a child that's never even had to deal with something like religion before, she has a lot of questions, like why doesn't God just fulfill people's wishes, or why do I have to sit on my knees in front of my bed and pray to pray, pray to uh, pray to God? Why can't I do something different? Why can't I make a bigger spectacle out of this? I know if I were God, <laughs> I would have liked to see somebody actually, you know. Do something. Yeah, why, why do I have to recite the words in certain ways? Why can't yeah. I just, you know, yeah. make it up on the spot and, and make it more exciting? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. I, she, she has very many questions. Like, it's the sort of thing, it's like, when I watched it, it's like, it sounds dumb, but at the same time, it makes sense. Because this isn't like, I mean, this is a child we're talking about again, right? Somebody has never had to deal with these types of things before. But she's just saying there's like, things that some of us, not so much me, but in this case, like Marilla, what just takes as like the absolute rule she's like how can you question this this is how it's supposed to be but they're legitimate questions why is it like that like why does it matter <laughs> so there, there's a lot of stuff like was that. it I, now I like now that. i do want to ask uh, was it was it during the carriage ride as marilla's taking and up to the uh the place where the, to the person where they asked for the adoption is isn't that when Anne kind of goes into, um, kind of hints at her past to Marilla, and that's where, uh, and that's yeah. where Marilla uh, gets that scent of of uh, empathy towards Anne because Anne hints Anne's been bounced around of different family members because her parents first died, and then she then she was uh she was given the task of like raising a family of five, uh, by herself basically, and they they you know you get hints of possible. Um, child abuse and maybe even uh, dare I say uh, sexual abuse, but you you, know, you don't ever truly know. It's up to your yeah. kind of imagination of how bad she had it before. She doesn't go that that into detail. I mean, kind of just to put that in perspective uh, on how she does it, because it's like it's like what was it when she was talking about one of the adopted family? She's like, uh, oh, like. I, like she's very afraid of being yelled at and one of the reasons is because like oh and when I would mess up uh, like one of the adoptive parents one of the adoptive mothers she would she would yell yell at me and she could even throw stuff at me or even even punish me right like punish and then it's like but it, and then it's like she's quickly immediately to go oh but it but it is not because it's not because I think she is evil or is bad or has evil in her heart she did care for me she did feed me she did do good she just also discipline me when doing that yeah it was almost like a, a stockholm syndrome kind of yeah. kind of mentality because i i remember she mentioned she briefly mentions like an abusive alcoholic stepfather yeah and uh mm -hmm. and it, yeah and yeah and she would again at the before she ends it she goes but it's okay he was just drunk yep <laughs> i know that when yeah, he drank he wasn't she his didn't, normal self <laughs> right she didn't have any other place to go you know Yep. So she and you know it's Ain. You realize Ain is a special, and she she can see wrong when she's someone when she sees someone doing something. She thinks she thinks it's wrong. At least at the beginning, she flips off. Oh yeah, like, doesn't matter who it is. She just nope. start screaming at a person. Yeah, say, how could you do that? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of that, you get so, like, you get Hickey. That's actually very good. You get a lot of that when she first meets just anybody really and it emulates yep. kind of her upbringing and and that goes to what tori said like yeah there used to there used to be a stepmother who would just straight up yell at her 
uh, the first emotion that would come to mind. So as you as you do when you're a child, you kind of emulate what your parents do or your what your what the adults around you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and she does. But, but kind of. She does not like. Uh, she does not like the uh, one of the uh, friend of Morellas. When she comes up, she is being kind of kind of rude because you know, kind of talking about how she has no manners and whatnot. And this deeply hurts. And and as well as you're going to learn what's her the thing she dislikes the most is when she is told that she has you know why they would adopt such an ugly girl with freckles and red hair that kind of sends her over the edge and she starts yelling at her and asks why why are you bullying me just straight up <laughs> right which obviously sends Morella into a huge shock why how would you why would you say this right but yeah because like, she makes she a point to someone like it is it is the late 1800s and she goes to someone older than her and say well would you like if i call you ugly fat <laughs> yeah that was so old good. woman <laughs> And Marilla is just in shock. She she doesn't know how to react to that. Uh, yeah, and he, uh, uh, what what's uh what's really interesting is, um, I wonder if not for that moment where Anne described her past in very in this very vague way, uh, but yet with enough detail for you to kind of know what happened. Um, if Marilla never had this empathy moment and understood because as you as you mentioned er, uh, earlier Tori with um just something simple of the time of like knowing your prayers uh Marilla probably yeah. wouldn't wouldn't have just said okay now we got now we got a teacher she's like good god this is going to be hard well upon having these kind of uh anger exploits you might you might call it these outbursts um kind of got her to look at it from a different perspective and and life in a different way as well. Uh so when when the uh when the when her friend goes away, uh she does go to her, you know, she does say, "Well, maybe, you know, okay, yeah, Anne was wrong and shouldn't have treated you that way and said those things, but you also need to look at it from from your perspective that you kind of also were in the wrong with what you said to her and how you approached her." Yep. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of this. There's a lot of there's a lot of having to just basically reteach her like basic morals, especially at the time, because she like with this she is kind of just emulating the world around her the way she's used to it, and she doesn't know any better, right? She nobody has ever taught. No, she's a for sorry, not foreigner. She's an orphan. Uh, no one has bothered to teach her anything, right? She's just help. <laughs> uh, so it's she definitely has a lot to go on, and you know at the start. As I said, she is kind of uh, interesting because she is, you know, she she's a child, but she is also kind of kind of stupid. Now that is not to say that she is always stupid because she eventually starts school, and you know they're very afraid of this because, well, first of all, she doesn't like her teacher, and her teacher doesn't like her. But uh, then there's a lot of problems there with, you know, uh, she doesn't like the social etiquette there and whatnot. But what she does is she is obviously far behind everyone else, so she has to catch up, and she gets kind of mocked for that. But as time passes, she not only catches up, she surpasses, because where most people go to school, because they should kind of have to, and it's not even a great school, it's just a school where all, where like a couple different kids are, and they're all in different classes and whatnot, and, uh, but she actually likes studying. A lot. Especially the, they have one teacher, and as the story progresses, they, he will eventually get replaced with a different teacher, a female teacher, who really nurtures Anne's talents for studying. Because she sees, you know, she's been working extremely hard just to catch up. She Remember, this, this girl had no capabilities of learning, or had never studied in her life. And in just a short little while, she's already catch, caught up to everyone else in her class. Like well, it's also important to note like that. that, um, you know, whether be at these moments in school, uh, finally socializing with other, other kids around her for the first time, uh, learning what it is to be like teased and, and bullied. Uh, there's, there's one moment in particular where Gilbert, this character named Gilbert Blythe, the, uh, the handsome boy who, uh, yeah. who also is going back to school uh, after helping, um, I believe it was his father was sick and he had to drop out for like a, a year or two. Yep. Uh, he goes back, and he's notor- he's known for being this handsome guy, but also notorious for teasing a lot of the girls. 
And uh, all it took was one simple moment where, you know, he's trying to tease Anne. Anne's like, Anne doesn't want to disappoint Marilla and Matthew. Uh, she wants to be on her... But then she's... he says the forbidden words. He <laughs> talks about her hair and freckles. And then there's even a moment, uh, and then it continues with him. She tries her best to ignore him, fair enough. But he straights up pulls on her hair and calls her, uh, what does he call her? Um, Ninja. Like a strawberry Carrot. head or something? Carrot. Yeah, I think it's called it carrot. Carrot head, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh Anne proceeds to take the, <laughs> the mini like blackboard and slam it over a, over his head in the middle of class. And it's it's got this crazy awesome animation of her doing yeah. it, and then the facial expression goes from like as you said, Tori, uh her her emotions like change on a dime. She just looks at him yep. like immediately with a scowl, takes that blackboard, slams it over his head, and you see the the slate just burst into into many pieces and and this was this was one of the major turning points because she never forgives this guy she holds never. it she she you learn you learn Anne holds a grudge for a long ass time <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but she also develops a rivalry with this guy which which becomes like a major motivation for her uh, level of studying and where she wants to take take that yep oh yeah uh, and, and you don't you don't ever really truly learn more about Gilbert Blythe himself, and, uh, mm. nor a lot about a lot of the other characters. You know there aren't like episode pieces dedicated to to these side characters. You just see everything yeah. from Anne's perspective, and Anne holds this grudge with this guy, so he's out in the distance just doing his own thing throughout the show. And I really really like that about it. Yeah, no, it's like uh, the way I say it, it's like. They are they are supporting characters in in their in like the way of you would expect a supporting character to be. They are there to have and experience different things. They are there to advance the story. As for them, apart from the very uh, apart from like the minimal things you need to know about them, they're not they're not explored because this isn't this isn't their story. This isn't Gilbert Blythe the anime. This is Akagi no Anne. <laughs> so it's like you know enough. You know who he is. You know that he works. You know that he has to take time off and work on a fa- uh, on a family farm. Uh, you know that he is uh, handsome. He is good at stuff. Yeah, you know he's handsome. You know, like yeah. he's <laughs> jokes. you know he's good at studying, and you know he's Anne's rival, and you know that, and also kind of, and that he also develops a crush for Anne, and kind of likewise. But well, I don't know if he truly develops a crush as opposed to more. This is the only it's... girl that won't like give him the time of day because he's handsome. <laughs> well, yes, but I definitely do think that develops into him taking an interest. In oh, there, there's so definitely an interest. There. Yeah, definitely because there's definitely he spent he spent the, the le- he spent the last of the series trying to get Anne to like him. Yeah, not even like him, just like you know him. forgive him. Mm-hmm. It takes six years <laughs> the guy to actually uh, get in terms with her, and you know uh, I think something we forgot to mention. Uh, the beginning is that Akaga Noen is based on a romance, uh, Anne of Green Gables, which is a series yeah. of books. And apparently, uh, the second and third book they focus a lot on Anne and Gilbert's relationship. Yeah, that doesn't that so doesn't I, shock I me by any he, means. He dev- yeah, I think they develop yeah a this romantic feeling, uh, especially. I guess we can. I a little sneak sneak peek on the last episode. When they kind of meet, uh, Ain talk to him, and she kind of blushes. So mm-hmm. you you know there's something going on at least the the end oh, of yeah. the series. Oh yeah, no, they they do like each other. They do that. Yeah, yeah, they uh, they, they yeah. The the relationship think... was was the point the point made, and just this first ep- first fifty was was handled well, especially um that Hick- Hickey you pointed out the time point in which it ends. Um, that yeah. that aspect was good. Yep, and you also have the like, and it kind of feels uh, just to mention as well because it's not like she just all of a sudden likes him at the end either. There, there's the moments where he when he's trying to, um, when he's trying to like gain her or forgiveness. That uh, especially one one time where he saves her from the uh, uh, from drowning in the river. But uh, like you know, where she de- definitely does start to. Get a bit confused by herself because you know she. On one hand, she wants to hate him because 
he did such hurtful things to her all those years ago. <laughs> and at the same time, it's like, but, you know, he's, he's a nice boy. He's a nice enough boy. He, but she can't quite bring herself to forgive him. But, so she has a bit of like, confusing moments. Like, she likes him, but she doesn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, she doesn't want to even admit it to herself. It's almost like she feels a, a sense of shame behind admitting, yeah. you know, maybe I was wrong about this guy. Yep. Uh, but that's okay. That's that's only a, a small part of the show. But it was very. It's very important uh, of that. What that relationship. De- uh, how it develops her. Mm-hmm. Um. Because the the one one of the, one of the aspects about the show that's handled so well is is the character development. Oh yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, is it is it okay we uh, we touch on this now? Oh yeah. Nice so, right. when you're a kid, uh, events, you know, uh, mold who you are, right? So each mm-hmm. major event that occurs in the show, and instead of just, you know, going through each event, just just know that, you know, whether you know, take take my own life, you know, or might take my own life, uh, at, at my own self <laughs> as an example. What the fuck, JD? <laughs> Please, my my Don't own take self. Your own life. <laughs> My own Please. self as an example of, let's say, when you ride a bike from from the first time, and uh, you don't know how to stop. You know, there's that sense of fear. Uh, so mm-hmm. you develop, you develop, you know, your character develops in a way of, I, for the next time, I'm going to know how to brake. Uh, so I won't crash again, because that, you know, whether, let's say I broke my ankle. You know, very important to not break my ankle again. Um, I'm going to know how to ride a bike. So in Anne's case, um, major events. She went cha- on top of a rooftop and then fell down. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> she did that too. Well, that well, later. you know, oh, her later. character develops in that sense that you know she was she was uh, out of school for like what was it like six six to eight weeks. Um, she yeah. missed an entire season. She uh, she was bedridden. She couldn't really associate with Matthew and Marilla as much. Um, uh-huh. y- when 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 Anne changed based on these events, the the changes were permanent. Oh, they yeah. weren't, you know. How many anime have we seen today where you know there's so called character development, but in the next episode, it's like it never happened. You know, I, oh yeah, oh, it yeah. happens oh, yeah. so well, often. It's so irritating. That... <laughs> oh yeah. One thing we need to to talk about in character development is actually actually physical development. That happens. Yes. Oh, sure. It is something that, w- that you don't you don't see that. It is I... so rare. And you know, go back to what we were talking about, board masterpiece theory. They were trying to make a point. So, oh, yeah. like, even with that, like, it is a, it is so hard. It's so it is. There's it. You know, it takes so much time to develop a character, like to draw a character, and you need to mm-hmm. change the the character design every two episodes. That's a lot oh, of that work. Did. That is a lot of work. And you know, yeah, we see is. that in, in Akaganoi. Well, there, yeah, there's, sub- there's subtle... I... There, yeah, there's definitely subtle differences, but there's also the very blatant outward differences in the physical character development. I mean, there's... there's. Well... Oh, okay, Tori, go on. Uh, yeah, because I just kind of... I, I just kind of want to ask you right before you get too much into the physical development. When did... Like, when did you guys first notice that Anne was changing physically? I mean, please... Don't laugh. Episode 15, I think, I noticed, like, as she was walking to school with Diana, I yeah. realized her chest was bigger. Yeah. Because, like, usually this in this show, you have a lot... Most of the time, you have Anne walking. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, usually walking with Diana, speaking something. The backgrounds, they are very beautiful. But oh, yeah. they don't have you don't have any reference in the background to kind of realize the camera moved. You know? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, they are passing by this house. And the camera was like getting this shot and now it's getting this shot. Oh, and got taller. You don't have those kind of things because usually they are wandering through woods. Uh mm-hmm. so like I remember like having like watching they talking and it was a side shot. And I realized that. Anne's chest was was actually bigger because when she came first came to to Green Gables, uh, she was she didn't have any chest at all. She was very fragile. Uh, her her very arms skinny. were very thin. 
Yeah. And you know, at that time in episode fifteen, she she was like she gained a little bit of weight. I I realized like yeah, I I, I noticed I noticed uh, I think it was around the fifteen mark as well that you could um she had gained a lot of a lot more weight. Like she looked like a person again instead of this eleven year old skeleton that we first saw. That's yeah. that's that's the what thing, I yeah. saw. That that's when I first noticed. Oh, they're actually a lot. They're they're changing, not just yeah. her emotional and uh, and and character. It, it was also physical. Oh yeah, and yeah, that's why mean, it's kind of hard to see because you do use like I know what I I I kind of ended up noticing it. Like I didn't notice. I had to use stuff as kind of reference because it didn't immediately was apparent to me because I wasn't expecting them to be to develop her physically which is kind of, I mean I, I did but not in that way like I was expecting just okay eventually she's just gonna get, time, she's gonna get taller skip. yeah like she's gonna get grow taller and whatnot. I, they kind of do that because you know they do have that moment where she walks in and Morella's like whoa you've grown tall but like you use like for example Morella as a as a scale for example right you look at her and it's like she used to not even reach up to her waist and all of a sudden she does you can use the chair as a scale because when she first gets into the house, when she jumps up on the chair and sits down, her feet is dangling in the air. After a little while, her feet can actually reach the ground and stuff like that. It's like, hold on, something is different here. <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah, yeah like, you almost it doesn't click right away, but you do like subconsciously know these things. Um, yeah, uh, and then eventually she grows a lot, and then you're like, oh, yeah, oh yeah. Well, we'll continue. Oh, damn, totally. Con- <laughs> continuing on the character development, because um, it's not just. And you notice it's also with Matthew and Marilla, but it's in a very much different aspect. They develop a lot slower because they're old. <laughs> well, yeah, you know their their characters are already developed, right? Because they're adults yep. already. But what what changes with them is how Anne has impacted their life. And the show also, you know, as the show goes on, they get more and more gray hair um, and w- what have you. But you know, Marilla, you know, Marilla starts out as this kind of hardened woman who who's very kind of one one direction viewpoint on the world and 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 changes her a lot in in that way to to see things from a different perspective realize that yeah she has a lot of these motherly instincts she didn't know she had um which i guess we'll get into later with with hickey's emotional uh outbursts (laughs) while watching it Uh, uh. uh and and even matthew uh you know awkward around all women um, when it comes to Anne, he develops so much feelings for her that he overcomes a lot of the this nervousness over time. Against her, <laughs> not well, so much against others. He tries. He ch- but well, he's that's still that's the thing. You know, uh, yeah. well, whether mean, whether it was whether it was a a, like... a, a, a uh, the, the female um, uh, pastor, I guess. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, there's there's sure? there's a moment where she comes to visit, and Matthew at the you know this is where when Anne's, Anne's still um, very young. He he would go as far as like no I I'm sick with the flu I'm bedridden I'm I'm not here, you know kind of thing. Yep. Uh, and then by the end of the show he want he you know he's going to stores he's never been to to buy buy an address from a female clerk that, you know he can now mm-hmm. finally talk to you know, in those aspects the, the the show, so it, to have character development, develop in 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 such a way that, you know is based in reality is so is so well done because we we know that's how life works yep the uh the only thing i was mentioning that was just he didn't actually buy a dress from her he got scared and he ended up buying like sugar or what or what no not sugar he ended up, well no that was the midway uh, point yeah yeah no nah, he did he did he didn't end up buying because i know uh i know it was the the friend morella's friend that ended up helping him with getting the dress in the end he couldn't do it by himself but he the point is he tried yeah which was way more than you could say from him in the beginning where he just he wouldn't even try he was just nope sorry can't do no <laughs> way <laughs> so yeah matthew is honestly like matthew is the sort of character that i thought i would actually be kind of annoyed by because he's incredibly he's incredibly dense he doesn't notice even the slightest things and it's he does <laughs> well, he is very awkward but he's such yeah, a there's, kind old man God damn it. i know i know like there is one instance in the show where they show you how dense matthew can be uh because <laughs> you know at the beginning of the series uh marilo is you know uh sewing dresses for Anne. uh 
And N is like, oh, can you give me poof uh, sleeves? Because everyone is using them. And Mario is like, no, you don't need them. You just need the, 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 the dress that is enough for you. Uh, and a year later, <laughs> Matthew realizes N is the only one without the poof sleeves. Yeah, that, that, that uh, I noticed that too. I when I watched that episode, you know, Anne finally has like a bunch of friends over, and they're talking about um, like they're going over like a Christmas play, and and uh, Matthew's kind of hiding in the other room, and he kind of cra- kind of peeks in, and he, <laughs> like that night, he's like, "What is different about Anne?" He's just poking, he's yep. puffing his pipe, he's in deep thought, he's like mumbling to himself. Marilla's like, "What the hell's wrong with you over there?" And he goes, "No, no, no, just thinking, what." Is uh, is it a red hair? No, no, that's not it. Um, uh, and then it like cuts to her dress, their dresses. Oh, <laughs> that thing she I talked s- about it, like a year for it over makes the year. sense now. <laughs> yeah, one year, one year for him to realize the difference between Anne and the other kids. Uh, <laughs> but you know, still he's he's a he's a gentleman. Mm-hmm. He's. I also thought I was I was going to be annoyed by him, especially because he's very passive. Uh, yeah. He doesn't. He's not. He don't do any confrontation, especially at the beginning of the series. When he he wants to talk back to Marilla, he does it. And when she says, "What did you say?" He was like, "No, no, I'm sorry. I didn't say anything. <laughs> didn't hear anything." Well, um, he um, be It's funny you mentioned that. He yeah, does. Yeah. He does also kind of over over time. He develops a okay, little bit that's... more confidence in those comments. Yeah. Like, he, he knows a different way to approach Marilla when it, when it concerns Anne. Like, before, he would just kind of blurt something out. And as you said, Hickey, he'd be like, no, I didn't say anything. But then he would, he would just kind of be going, you know, I think it's okay. It's, you know, it's just something simple as, uh, you know, it's okay to pamper someone every now and again for doing something good. <laughs> and Marilla's shocked every time. He's like, what did you just say? Do you think you know how to race and better than I do? Yeah, because I'm a female. I know. I know better. And he's like, "All right, whatever. If you say so." <laughs> and then it's like, and then it's like, eh. like, "Well, if you need me, I'll be out in the shed." <laughs> <laughs> or, or uh, I, the turning point was when uh, he first talks back to her, uh, Marilla, and I believe oh, I can't quite put my finger on when, like, what they were talking about, but he says one thing. Marilla talks back. And then uh, he's he's like, yeah, I'm gonna he go. He's heading outside to the shed, and he just gets that one last word, and I think it's okay. And then he closes the door. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember Marilla's turning point because it was the brooch. That one is yeah. like it was very out in the open. But Matthew Matthew was very like it was little by little it, it didn't have a turning point i think every single time he talked back or talked to a woman was a turning point for him <laughs> uh, just you, just so you know you know how difficult it is uh, or it was for him yeah you got to learn how difficult it was uh, you yeah. got you got to know how hardened marilla was and how awkward and uh dense matthew was but you also got to slowly see how those two characters uh, loved Anne over time. They didn't. They didn't just see her as you know the help. Yeah, yeah. They stopped seeing her as a. Uh, there, there was a moment where they kind of. I know. I don't remember. I mean, obviously Matthew has had this for a long time where he has cared for her. But I know. I remember there was a moment where Morella <laughs> kind of finally re- realizes that she doesn't. She's stopped looking at Anne as like the, uh, the. A, like the orphan that she's adopted that she has to l- teach right she knows how to compose her and she looks at her as you know when she realizes it's like instead of being like i think it's something i think it was something along the lines at first it was just you know it was them two us referring to uh marilla and matthew and then Anne, and at, at some point it becomes us three and it's like wait i'm including her as part of this fa- this little family huh <laughs> Huh, what do you know? I think I, I yeah. think one of the one of the major um at least for while I was watching, it did take a while for me to understand Marilla herself and, and plainly see the change. Because there were there were there were the subtleties for sure, like as that moment, oh yeah, three people or or Anne, or Marilla would slowly defend Anne more and more. 
Uh, it was that it was the moment where Anne turns. I think it was fifteen, where there's kind of that. Marilla looks up at Anne, uh, and that's the moment when you realize when she realizes how tall she was. It it has this kind of phasey, hazy, change, aspect of of Anne. Th- she realize you grew up, and it's almost you know if yep. you, if you're a parent. Uh, time passes in an instant, and for Marilla, it was always like, "Oh my God, you're," and over the course of like, I guess it was that kind of week or two, that Marilla herself started realizing, "Wow, this isn't the same child we raised. Now she's all she's an adult. Yeah. Now she's all grown up." Mm-hmm. When he does, she doesn't no longer have to be told what to do. She kind of just goes and like, uh, it's that, and Morel's like, I've got, I'm going to put on put on the food or I'm going to put on some tea or something. And Anne is just like, nah, I'll do it. It's like, whoa, what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like you, yeah. You just said, I'll do it. Definitely the more impactful moments for Marilla's character was after Anne does a, uh, a stage play. Oh, yeah. A recital. And um, she's, she's uh, doing a a solo recital for Marilla and Matthew. And uh, as Marilla is listening, uh, there's, uh, I believe this is actually the first moment of, of uh, uh, the, the show's use of flashbacks, Uh um, which takes, which took a long time to do actually. And Marilla's as, as the flashbacks going on, it puts it in perspective that Marilla herself is kind of, remembering these moments and marilla starts to tear up remembering and is very saddened by the fact that it's no longer going to be the three of us time f- passed by in an instant yep. well you it's not only like, it's whatnot. not like it's not only that you know it's not uh ain is moving on it's becoming an, an adult also you know those instances where marilla was against adopting ain and Marilla doubted Ain uh, when it comes to the brooch. Like she thought, like she thought Ain stole the the brooch, uh, stole it and lost it. Yeah. Ain's making, yeah. Uh, the when Ain made the cake and she and she like put the wrong ingredient in the cake. Uh, uh, those kind of things and all the doubt she had in Ain and now like she conf- confronted that with her love for for the same kid uh and how when grew up she become this uh fair maiden she start crying you know it is a very parent like thing to do uh okay um yeah. we we we're uh we're we're kind of brushing but um brushing around the subject but i think this is a great time to talk about kind of the pacing and progression in the show yeah uh so this is where I have a lot of my notes because as I was watching the show, uh, this is definitely the aspect of the show that stands out, and uh, I'm gonna say it right away. This is the best show, Tori, in Hickey that I have ever seen with its use of progression and pacing. Like it's almost not even close. So it's and it, so it use it uses subtleties like uh like uh, certain locations. You know, whether it's uh, the schoolhouse or uh, the bridge by uh, by Green Gables where Anne and Diana meet and, and talk about serious subjects. Um, it also uses seasons to kind of give you a, uh, a sentiment of the passage of time. Summer is always kind of related with a year has passed in the show. Winter is always related to kind of the down points in life. Um, you know, less color and whatnot they always they there always seems to be like more the more serious events in winter more the more uh, compli- uh complicated things mm-hmm. um uh each okay so so progress the the, pro- the way the show uses progression we touched on earlier uh as tori said where you know it takes like 25 episodes for the show to pass in a year uh, there are different arcs in it for sure over that year, but they were major yeah. events in how it impacts Anne and who she is and her character. And then, seemingly, as the show continues on in these arcs, each one starts to get shorter but cover more periods of time. Because hmm. as you get older, time passes faster. 
you know, the, 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 the moments in your life are less impactful, but they're related to a more serious subject matter. Um, yep. where, where it got really good in that aspect for, for me, as I was watching, was uh, as she's studying for her uh, kind of this uh, boarding high school entrance exam. Uh, this is where it was kind of the most apparent on how much time starts passing faster. Where, mm-hmm. you know, she has to study over the course of a year just to take, you know, to take the test and get in along with uh, some other some other kids in the class. And uh, beforehand, you know, w- we would get, you know, Anne breaks, breaks her ankle and six weeks pass. In this case, now a year has passed and it took half as many episodes. Why, you know, uh, this is a great example of why, you know, you, the show doesn't have to have the same amount of episodes to to just say, yeah, she studies more and more and more. It did so, it did simple yeah. things like Marilla say, having a line that's, you know, Anne's been studying a lot lately. She She's not, she's exhausted. She's getting, she's not getting up as early as, as she used to. We have to kind of help her. I was like, wow, this yeah. is, this is great writing, great pacing, a great representation of what's going on. You know. J.D.? Uh, just uh, to kind of throw sure. in there as well. Uh, the thing that's nice in that, this moment as well is that it's not also that like it's just oh, like because I just feel like it's important to mention. It. It's not like they're just skipping through it either. It's not like stuff isn't happening. You have small uh, well, I say small stuff, but stuff happening like she, Anne is studying studying to get into the school. Um, you have the snowstorm that's happening when the mm-hmm. entire class gets snowed in. You have the uh, the moment where uh, this is obviously when they got their new teacher, the female teacher. And this is, uh, you have the moment where, you know, Diana realizes and also tells Anne that she's actually not going to study study for that school. She doesn't want to get in there. And kind of when they realize that they're, they're even their friendship, they're, they're both some friends. They've reached kind of an impasse where they're going to have to, not that they're no longer going to be friends, but that they're now going to be separated because of this. And, you know, Anne has to kind of take a realization. It's like, do I really want to do this? And she's obviously comes to terms that, yes, she does want to do this. And she kind of, instead of, instead of focusing so much on herself, she's kind of like, but Diana should also do it. But, you know, she eventually learns to let go and stuff like that. So it's like, it's not like, it's not like the pacing just like starts going incredibly fast. And it's just like, oh, she's studying. Oh, the year's passed. Let's go. Like, it, it's not like that. Stuff is still happening. It's just that it doesn't take, like, like JD said, it doesn't take so long. It doesn't, every little thing is, is no longer new. Right before, when we get introduced to Anne, she would point to every flower, every tree, every lake, and give them names. Yeah, you no longer have that. <laughs> she doesn't do that anymore. Well, she she matured. She still yeah. have that, but you know, it's 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 in a different it, it's in a different way, in a different light. Uh, when she was young, she was going around pointing and stuff and giving names. With 15, 16, 17 years old, she's going out in a stroll and, you know, picking up berries and eating them. All those kind of things. On the pace, yep. I think it's interesting, you know, when you're watching, when I was watching, especially the first 25, I thought it was very dragged off. Because there's no way you, you won't think think of it. Like, you, you won't think, oh, no, that's not dragged out. One year, 25 episodes. Six, six five, six oh, yeah. years, to also 25 episodes. Like, uh, as I passed the first year, I start to realize that uh, we are actually seeing the time pass uh, the same way Ain is seeing that. I think the, the best way to explain it are the first five episodes. Uh, the first five episodes, they show you two days. Just two yeah. days. Five episodes for two days. It was Ain coming to Green Gables, Ain discovering uh, she might not stay at Green Gables because they don't want her. And then you just go up until Marilla says, no, we want Anne to, you know, stay in Green Gables. So the amount of anxiety and fear Anne was uh, feeling at that time made the, made the, the, time, uh, the time perspective pass slowly. The, the time was passing slowly because Anne was feeling a lot of anxiety and fear. Uh, where you go, you know, like you guys said, you we go to the future and and is studying for exams uh, to enter a call. It, it's not a college, but uh, a high school. Yeah, it's a boarding kind of school. Place. Yeah, a boarding school. 
uh, time passes uh, faster because she doesn't have time to think about anything aside from study. And when you are studying, time flies by. Yep. So like that is very interesting. If you just look at the the how the how the time is spent and used, you are just gonna say, "Oh, that was dragged out. That uh, the first part was dragged out. The second part was rushed." No, it wasn't, because uh, you need to take in, in account the subtitles uh, of this series, especially when it comes to the main character and how they use her perspective to tell the story, especially with how she perceives the time. time yeah, perceiving time uh, also goes with how a lot of Anne's imagination blended with reality. I mentioned that at the start. Uh, we haven't at all really touched on the art style at all. We, there's a lot of stuff we haven't touched on. Uh, I just kind of want to quickly, quickly sum up something. And by the way, uh, major spoilers, but this is going to go very, very fast. Uh, and... She obviously gets into this boarding school, and uh, she also receives a high... She also takes a test that gives her a high... Uh, well, she becomes the number one student, and then technically can go on a long tuition. I think it was like a three-year tuition or whatnot. To just she can go to a four-year college and, uh, and Four year do college. what yeah. she wants, and then... Um, yep. Yeah. However, however, uh, Matthew has turned ill. Uh, this is kind of the thing, because Matthew's had a heart problem for a while. But because they don't want to worry Anne and don't want to get in the way of her future, because Marilla and Matthew, they know Anne by this point. She is willing to drop everything to help them out. So they don't want to worry her. Uh, but she does find out and she gets very upset and decides to essentially give up her future for to help them out. So she it's an interesting, kind of tries it's to an do... interesting character choice. Uh, yeah. That's a topic in itself that. Uh, and she, yeah. she, uh, we can we can get comments on. I just want to kind of finish it up quickly. Yeah. She stays with them, and she is uh, helping out. She tries to help Matthew out on the farm. They get some hired help as well. She is doing everything she can. Um, eventually, the the money they had saved up in a bank, uh, the bank goes bankrupt because this gang goes to show how kind Matthew is. Too kind. Uh, he trusts the banker, and because they're friends, way too much, and he ends up losing all his money. Uh. He, he, at this point, Matthew has collapsed many times, and the doctors told him he needs no shocks. It could send him over the edge. When he finally reads, when he has been reassured one last time by the banker that everything is fine, nothing is wrong. You just keep your money here, and he decides to do that. And the next day, he reads in the, in the newspaper that the uh, bank is gone bankrupt, and all their money is gone. And he has his final shock, and his heart stops, and uh, he dies. And, you know, you have this very sad moment and whatnot, and uh, yeah, that is, Icky knows, I know, it was a very impact, impactful moment. It, not not a, not necessarily a, it wasn't a shock, because <laughs> yeah, they, had, the they definitely established that, that this heavy. was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, they definitely established that this was going to happen, but the way it happens, and, you know, kind of that realization that, God damn it, I cared for this old man, this, this kind old man. Yeah, like, definitely, because, like... <laughs> It it makes you sad because the same kindness that make you like Matthew, he kind of kill him. Yeah, you know he yeah. he died of shock because he was too kind and trusted his friend, and you know because of that you like Matthew, but then you you realize that because he's too kind, he trusted this guy he shouldn't be trusting, got all the mo- like all the money went away because you know the the bank got bankrupt. And he was in shock. He couldn't believe it. And he instantly died. Like, at, yeah. at least at least he didn't suffer. At least. Yeah, yeah he, he just dropped dead. And, you know, yeah. it's important also to note during this time that Marilla's pretty much going blind. Yeah, the stress has had an effect on Marilla as well. And she's just... She's losing her sight. And well, that was that was gradually doctor, happening stress, from, but... you know, her getting headaches yeah. and then going to the doctor. She gets glasses and... Uh, oh, yeah. She still can't see as much. Everything becomes hazy in her eyes. Yeah, yeah. Let's put it this way: there's nothing in this show that doesn't happen for a reason. <laughs> nothing in this show, nothing that nothing that comes up in this show doesn't like comes as a shock. It's not like oh shit, Matthew died. It's like you know it's gonna happen. He's getting old, and he is 
very weak. But he still has to work on the farm. And do all he can, even though he shouldn't. But that's sad, such as the times. But it doesn't make it any less sad when he when it finally happens. Sure, Marilla sure. Yeah. Obviously, this is like you, you know, know. Uh, Anne has to stay and help out Marilla. You have that fuck. You have that sad moment where after Matthew died, where well, kind of you get to remember Matt, Matthew, where he kind of reappears and he's like, "Oh, remember, that got you me. are my the daughter. Ghost, the you ghost, are my the daughter." Ghost got me. Yeah, yeah he uh, said like in the day, like the day before he died, he said to Anne. Uh, because, uh, Ayn, uh, you got the scholarship. It wasn't a boy who got the scholarship. It was a girl. My girl. Doesn't matter what happens. You are my daughter. It was one of the sweetest moments of this entire series. And the day after that, he just collapses. He dies. And, you know, Ayn feels bad because, uh, during the, the morning and all of the process, Ain didn't do, Ain didn't cry. She didn't cry. Yeah. Uh, she, she and she was feel feeling the emotion she normally did. Yeah, she was feeling frustrated because she couldn't cry for the the guy she loved so much, you know, uh, this this sweet old man who you know uh, got her and raised her. She couldn't cry. So when she was alone, she re- remember of his words and just thought crying and that got me oh it was so sad and then like marilla's coming comes in and you know she through 48 episodes she's this strict 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 lady uh mm-hmm. she, you know she there's not a lot of a lot of instance where she goes out of character uh but in this time like she start crying and look at Anne and say look just because i'm harsh just because like i don't I don't smile too much, and you know I usually rip rip hand you. Doesn't mean I love you less than Matthew did. So like it, that also got me. It, it was so emotional. There was also a good yeah. moment for Marilla. Uh, one of the high, another yeah, highlight there. was um, when Anne. Uh, she was gone for I guess like six months, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, Anne sees Diana, and she, uh, Diana's like, oh, you, you know, Marilla and Matthew are waiting for you, and she's like, no, 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 I got stuff to tell you, and Marilla sees, uh, <laughs> sees Anne uh, out in the field, why isn't she coming home, why has she got to talk to her all the time, and Matthew's like, come on, they're friends, they haven't seen each other in a while, and, uh, yeah. Marilla, it's like, oh my god, she, she gets a little jealous, and then as Anne's coming back, um, <laughs> she's like, oh, Marilla's coming. Oh my god. Uh, 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 she quickly goes into like her place. She, she nonchalantly like starts washing dishes. Oh, Anne, you're back. Okay. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you no, see Matthew's like expression said, just going, oh, come yeah. on. <laughs> it's like I said. It's like I said. She's she's kind of a soon dead, eh? <laughs> not, in the sa- not in the same way as a trope, but she is definitely like, she wants to, she has one person that she wants, wants to pretend. She is cold. She is harsh. And that's why it's also, I like that scene at the end, towards the end of the series. Where, you know, where Marilla has gone almost completely blind. She can't see very much. And they're sitting out on the porch. And her, uh, Marilla's friend is coming over again to visit. And it's like, uh, Anne is sitting there next to her. And she's like describing the flowers and the scenery in the way that, you know, she's always done to Marilla. And then when her friend comes over, she's like, oh, uh, Miss, I forget her name, but uh, Lynn. She's, com- she's coming now. Yeah, Miss Lynn. She is uh, coming over now. And it's like, you know, just kind of, kind of that little, nice little moment where it's like, uh, to put it this way, the, the it's not nice because she's obviously going blind, but it's like just you see that. Like, <laughs> Come on. Uh, well, it's I, I mean it's not nice that someone's going blind, but it's like I know you, know, you I see know, that moment with uh, uh, with them where they, where they can sit down and have these these moments now because you know of all the all that's happened. You know they are. It's like a daughter taking care of her, taking care of her. You know, uh, old mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean. Uh, for me personally, um, this is a great instance of, I was very annoyed with the last, I want to say, 10 to 12 episodes of the show. Uh, I'm not saying the con- the content or anything was bad, you know, things were definitely emotional. I was more annoyed with a lot of the character choices, um, especially on Anne's part. And, you know, just simply on the fact that I would not have made the same choices. But I would I understood her choices. That's the that's what that's important to take out of it. Uh, so it's a great example of 
of I'm not agreeing with what's happening on screen, but that's okay. You know, whether it whether it's uh, you know, Anne gets the highest honors and gets a scholarship to go to go to school, and that's what Matthew wants out of her, and she instead decides to just straight up turn it down. I gotta I gotta live with them. My future's thrown away. Uh, just to just to be here and essentially do nothing. That's the way I, I took it. I understood her I choice didn't took, though. And I why. didn't took that way. Uh, if yeah. you if you may permit me, uh, because like the way you took it uh, is just like Ayn says. Uh, you did so much for me. Now it's my time to do something for you. Because you know if you think about it, if Marilla and Matthew didn't. Uh, bring her in, raise her. She wouldn't have a future. No, I uh, again, yeah. I understand would, all that for sure. So, like, for her, being a teacher in the near school, being with the being with her loved ones, is already enough. Is already the future. Uh, aside from that, if she could go to college. And a little spoiler on the books, apparently she goes to college after that. Probably after Marilla's die. Uh, Marilla's death. Probably. Uh, yeah, she would have to pay that, her own way uh, to do that. But yeah. yeah. After, like, uh, everything, after becoming a teacher or, like, being with a family, an actual family who loves her, who cares for her, it is profit. You know, she doesn't need it. Right, right. So like, yeah. Uh, I, I, I also had a back, uh, back in my head thought during this time. It's like you worked hard to get this scholarship. In the background, Gl- Gilbert Blythe also wanted that scholarship so he could afford to go to college. But Anne worked so hard just because of a grudge and a rivalry uh, to to get it as well. Um, Gilbert Blythe could no longer go because because of that. And then for Anne to turn it down was kind of a if I was Gilbert Blythe, I would have personally had a conversation with her going, either you go to college or I'm going to hit you <laughs> because you took this away from me. I'm going to hit you with the blackboard. <laughs> I'm going to hit you with a blackboard this time. <laughs> nah, I I thought it was a, ni- a nice little gesture because it's like, it's not that she's giving up on anything she or her future. She is giving up on the chance to study, which she likes. And yeah, sure, she could have made a lot out of herself and... But, like, kind of the way, I mean, she has trouble with this. That's why she talks to the uh, pastor's wife. And, you know, like she says, just like anything, it, uh, like nothing is just straightforward. There is never simply just one road to walk down. Right. The road will always divide. Or always, And you will always have to make choices. Like, and you, can, you cannot say that one choice is right or wrong. It's just kind of you have to decide which way you want to go. And Anne decides that at this current moment, she needs to be with her family. He does not need to go to college right now. He can go, always go to college later, but she can't return to her family later. Yeah, and that's that's why I understood yeah. all of the choices, even though I didn't totally agree with it. Yeah, but yeah. like definitely, you don't agree. I I would make the same choice because See, I, agree I, with I wouldn't it. have so, made you know, that choice. I understand it, and I didn't make that choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did make that choice, but yeah. I I could go to. A college in another state, actually, but you know, uh, my and I, I wanted to go, uh, but you know, my father had some heart problems, and I I decided to actually stay here and stay instead of going to a public college in another state. I decided to stay here and you know, uh, do my best to get a a scholarship with the government. Uh, I'll, I'll have to pay the government back when I'm done, but you know, just to be with my father because I know he he, he needs me. You know, so I technically did the the, uh, the choice. Fortunately, my father didn't die of a heart attack, just like Matthew. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad as well. Yeah, but technically, Hickey, we, we I had did a, the same we, choice as Anne. Yeah, when you when uh, when we were talking about you know like the whole moving away from home part, uh, you and I were actually having a small conversation. I wanted to save it for the cast because, as you said, you you made the decision to stay, and then. Myself, around that same age, I was 17, I moved to Germany. And during that time, my grandfather had cancer. 
and I chose to stay in Germany for my future because I felt that was this was the I took the, I took that as this is the only opportunity that I can I can have. And I remember having a, having one last conversation with my grandfather that Christmas, um, and uh, you know he told me, "No, I'm proud of you. This is what I wanted out of you. Um, if you would have stayed, that would have made me." disappointed so you know when when in akage no an during that moment i was kind of frustrated not kind of i was frustrated because matthew wants wanted the best for Anne. he he even constantly said no i you know don't worry about me and my heart problem you know you do you for your future that would make me the most proud so Anne, not listening to his requests i thought was i took it as insulting to his wishes. This is, these are the people that cared for you. Um, well, yes, but I mean, just the only problem there is like, if she would have, uh, yes, it's Matthew's uh, wish that she, she would go to college, but I mean, she does make a promise that like she says, she can go to college later. It's not like she's giving up on it. She hasn't given up on anything. Her dream is to be a teacher. She can become a teacher. So she hasn't given up on anything. And if, let's put it, if I feel like if Anne would have basically said, okay, I will honor your wishes and I will go. That would have been very much against who Anne is as a character. No, no, yeah, you're right, you're right. Talk with the pastor's pastor's wife, because, you know, like she tells her, ultimately what you choose to do is up to, like, kind of comes up to who you are as a person and what you value, right? None of these things, none of these choices are wrong. It's just you kind of have to make a choice. And who who do you want to, like, who are you? Like, what what kind of person are you? And Anne is kind of like, well, I'm the sort of person who will stick by by the people who love me and by the people I love, I care for. So yeah, it, it was as such. Yeah. I choose to do that. It, yeah, I mean, the, the the show did such a good job at developing Anne herself that I would have been more shocked if she didn't make that decision. You know what I mean? So just be, yeah. you know, it, it was literally the tale of two different people of what what a decision you know I would make or what Hickey would make or what you would make, Tori, to what Anne would make her herself. So it's. Mm-hmm. It's the level of writing that was consistent from start to finish. Yep. Nah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Nah. Honestly, uh, that is a, in my opinion, it's a fantastic story. And, uh, yes. I, when I, when I think of Anne, or, or yeah, I, uh, I struggle to find, uh, I struggle to find flaws. Like I said, there are obvious flaws. I don't even mean in story, in story. I mean like obvious flaws. Like, like I told JD, or I talked to you guys about it. There are were a couple of episodes. There were the normally very smooth and very, uh, you know, expressive animation, or not expressive animation. That's ever like uh, when they animate movement in this show. It's very like it's it feels incredibly not just fluid but like real. Uh, they move, they move like a human would. Uh, even Matthew starts hunching over and whatnot after, as he gets <laughs> more and more as he gets older and. Things like that, and it's expressed very well in in the movement. But there were a couple episodes. They kind of, I, they definitely had a had a rough patch towards like somewhere in the middle of the show where the movement got a lot more stiff and like they would make more sudden movements that didn't feel so organic and human. It was like grabbing out of something that just the arm would like jolt out to the side to grab it and stuff, like moving to grab it. Yeah, but I, I mean like that, that more or less was just a product of the time. And and well, yes, and the product of the fact that they tried to do technically way more than what was <laughs> recommended uh, at the time. Yeah, well, I, I guess like I, I think I something... think you're picking picking. Uh, no, I know. Being picky I, I at still that have point. to point yeah, it out yeah. because it is because it is <laughs> yeah, no, it is. Like, if you want to talk, it, look at it technically, it's a problem with the production. I'm not saying it's a huge problem with the overall show, but it technically does show a problem with the production. Well, n- not technically, not. Really, it, it is just interesting that they were trying to make a point that you don't need to cut corners in animation, but they had to cut corners at some <laughs> points. Uh, yep. So, like, it actually shows you that we, uh, not we, but the animators, they are trying to get away from Osamu Tezuka's way of cutting corners since the 60s, but it's hard. Yep. It is just it is. hard. It is. It's hard and it's expensive. Uh, so I, one of the it things also that I also very much how yeah. strong it is. The how how strong was Samu Tezuka's boss? You know, oh, as yeah. a creator, as an animator, to sh- 
yep. to have this almost perfect way of saving money and time <laughs> that even the guys who were trying to go against it had to use it at some point. <laughs> oh yeah. No, nah, it's it's a solid rule. It, 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 that it's a reason why it's still in place today. Uh one thing that I really appreciate as well about Anne is its use of backgrounds. Because god damn it, those they're watercolored backgrounds and they look beautiful. I there are so many times where I just look where I just paused it to look to look at the backgrounds and I just said I could fuck I could just like print screen this and fucking hang it up on my wall. It's so goddamn beautiful. And not only that. It is incredibly rare. It was very rare for them to reuse the same backgrounds. I noticed that. They they changed them so often. Well, yeah, it was like, related to, to seasons and weather and yeah. and uh, the trees in full bloom and and the birch yeah. trees being cut down. Like as as the world changed around it, so did the backgrounds. Oh yeah, it, it, it was no surprise when I heard that they. They had to hire an entirely separate studio with its entirely separate team uh, just in order to make this happen because there was no way they could have somebody on the team of animators to also do backgrounds while doing this. That would just never work. <laughs> they needed an entire team of artists to make this this happen. It is... Yeah, nah. Honestly, like... The, the level of production and added. I assume, and a bunch of other World Masterpiece Theater uh, shows as well, are just incredible. Like, not just for its time. It's incredible. You, you could put that up today and you'll be like, yep, that's that's pretty good. What was, <laughs> what was noticeably different about Akage no Anne than the other World Mas Peter Masterpiece Theater shows that I'd seen uh, at this point was there was no filler, so to say. No episode felt like it was an episodic experience. Everything felt like it had purpose, uh, whether it be to the story unfolding or the character development for Anne. Uh, that's what felt beyond what, say, 3,000 Leagues of Mother uh, would do at times, or, or very much particular Heidi. Like, yeah, okay, they were, they were part, you know, slices of life, part moments, um, but... You know, in those cases, it felt like episodes could be taken out, and the overall character development story would have been fine. In Akage no Anne's case, I never even got that feeling or or uh, or even a thought. Um, so that that's what I took away, uh, at least in comparison to other World Masterpiece Theater uh, pieces. Yeah, for sure. Uh. I think we've talked at length about this show. Sure, now. sure. So I think it's. I think we can. Uh, uh, we can uh, wrap it up now. But like I said earlier, I wanted to ask you guys the question, and the question is: Was I right or was I right? Uh, You're right. Okay, fine. <laughs> I cried watching this show. You're right. God fucking damn it. <laughs> JD? Uh I shall answer you in German. How about that? <laughs> I would prefer anything. Like no, nah, well, too bad. <laughs> uh, Tori, uh, du hast uh, sehr recht für Akage no An ist war ein uh, perfekt uh, anime. Well, at least I understand. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's not perfect, Damn. okay? I, I, uh, I disagree. But, but yeah. fine. Not with JD. Uh, so, uh, so also, I, I, gave... feel like, I feel like reading the, game, the, the books. Continuing oh, on. I agree with Eki. Yeah. I agree with Eki. I definitely do. So, scores, people, scores. What do you score it? Uh, okay, uh, I'll go. I give it an eight, but I, I can easily give it a nine. Now that eight's I discuss it about it, I can easily give eight. it a nine. Eight's a good score. I'm not complaining. Well, nine's eight. like as high as you go, Hickey. <laughs> well, that says something. Yeah, that does say something. So, um, uh, Tori, you were right. Um, as, as, as the, uh, the subject matter is, it's part of World Masterpiece Theater, and it's a masterpiece to me. Again, I mentioned that this is the best show I've ever seen in progression, its use of progression and pacing. Uh, the writing is, to me, rock solid. Um, even a case where I didn't agree with character choices, I understood them. Um... 
I see, I, I saw nothing wrong with the show. It's, to me, a masterpiece. I gave it a 10 yeah. out of 10. That oh is, uh, my god! I, I thought I would is be our first the stand? Resident, uh... Was that our first stand? I not think it is. Not, not counting Neon Genesis Evangelion. Because, you know, oh, that is yeah. biased as fuck. Uh, yeah. I think this is our first stand. <laughs> I do think so. I don't remember any previous stand. Cool, so, yeah. awesome. I, I, here I thought I would be the resident of fucking Akagi no Ad Lover, but god damn it, the JD. <laughs> uh, I really, really, really love Akagi no Ad. Uh, I had it recommended to me um, a long time ago, and it's, just, it's one of those shows that I've always meant, intended to do. And one day I finally said, you know what? God damn it, I'm going to watch this show. And it was in, for, in, it was in this quest. It was a very good excuse. And when I watched it, I loved the shit out of it. I am a mark for Slice of Life type of shows. Uh, for sure. But this one was just on another level to most of them. And uh, I loved it. I ended up giving it a 9. Like I said, I had slight issues with certain aspects of it. But never enough for me to, never enough for me to sit down and go... That... Uh, or nothing important enough for me to say that I could properly, like, say that the show did anything poorly. But because I had those moments, I felt like I couldn't give it a 10. So, that's the only reason it could have gotten a 10. It very nearly did. But instead, it ended up getting a strong 9. Yeah, uh, the way I looked at it was, um, 1979 production, uh, with what was coming out at the time, what had come out come out at the time, what ca- what even came out afterwards, uh, to I I thought that knocking at points at all for kind of just the nitpicky stuff, even for 1979, uh, it, it wasn't enough to just disregard it from being a, the the masterpiece that I think it was. So, cool. So thank you, Tori. This was this was amazing. It was an amazing experience. This was a ride. This was a ride, for sure. Well, that just about does it, then. We have talked about what we want to talk about, I assume. Yep. Yep. Definitely. So, so we. Uh, this has been episode twenty-one. Well, well, the, uh, well, 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 well. Where, where well, can they? Where can the people find us? And what's our next episode? Right. Uh, they can uh, find you can find this uh, Red Leaf Retrocast anime on uh, anime podcast on iTunes. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it. You can find it on uh, Stitcher. You f- everywhere. We we're we're all over the place. It's search if you have a place where you like to find a podcast, search for us. We're probably there. You can so, simply Google yeah. uh, Redleaf Retrocast, and at the very least, the YouTube videos will show up. Oh yeah, we're not hard to find. And our next yeah. episode, if you don't mind me taking it from here, Tori. Be my guest. And our next episode is a long time coming. Uh, it, was, it was a it was one of the first suggestions, and we finally getting around to it. Our next episode is Initial D. Yay! What a Asia time skip! I've just been in this place uh. before. <laughs> is everyone excited for it? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well, alrighty. Uh, I think uh, I think that does it. I th- yep. Peace. Good luck.